Oh, hello. <laughs> Meanwhile, in uh, other news, the uh, thing that's going to kill us all has not gone away. Climate change is still coming at us like a tsunami. Unless you don't believe in science, in which case your ignorance will protect you, you could use it as a flotation device. Britain had its wettest day on record earlier this month, with enough rainfall to fill, to fill get this, Loch Ness. <coughs> To fill Loch Ness, and that is, um, and, and that is, and this is statistically accurate, huge. <coughs> Did you know that Loch Ness is the deepest loch in the land and holds more water than all of the lakes, rivers and reservoirs in the whole of England and Wales combined? Did you know that? Well, I read it on the internet, so... It must be true. What do I know about it? All I know is what's on the internet. October the 3rd brought an average of 31.7 millimetres of rain across the country, the most since records began 129 years ago. Whenever that was. And to put that in proper measurements, 31.7 millimetres, you double it and add 32 to get feet. So 31.7 millimetres doubled is 67.5, and 67.5 plus 32 is 117. Wow. There was 117 feet of rain that fell in one day. Can you believe that? No. And scientists say that extreme rain may become more common because of a global warming. But as they are just experts in possession of facts, nobody is remotely interested in anything they have to say. Affirmative. Met Office's spokesmodel Mark said, In climate statistics, 2019 will be remembered for possessing the UK's hottest day, whereas 2020 will be associated with rainfall records. <laughs> well, I suppose so. In climate statistics, yeah, in, in every other regard, it's uh, going to be remembered for the invisible menace. What the hell am I going to do over Chris? If I, and the schedule hasn't been announced yet, but if I do my normal thing, the A to Z of, of this year, what am I going to do? Well, we've got V for virus. Other than that, nothing. Anyway, um, uh, the uh, bloke at the Met office, se or, or woman, sexist, said, In climate statistics, 2019 will be remembered for possessing the UK's hottest day, whereas 2020 will be associated with rainfall records. He said enough rain fell on October the 3rd to fill Loch Ness, which holds 7.4 cubic kilometres of water. Wow. <laughs> Making it Britain's largest lake by volume. Isn't that interesting? No. Met Office climate spokesmodel Graham said the UK's rainfall contains many extreme events, but it's clear from the UK's climate projections that with warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers, we can expect increasingly more extreme rainfall records towards the end of the century. Assuming we all live that long. Wait a minute, end of this century? None of us are going to live that long. Well, some of us might. He says there's a simple relationship between a warmer atmosphere and an increased amount of moisture in the atmosphere. This again suggests that the UK is likely to witness increased rainfall and more record-breaking events. On the other hand, climate change is just a, a plot to control our minds with microchips that Bill Gates and George Soros are planning to insert through our ears while we're looking up the weather forecast. Everybody knows that. I saw it on Facebook. Check it if you don't believe me. Climate change is increasing the risk of more extreme weather, such as, but not but um, not limited to, intense heavy downpours. Scientists warn. The hottest day recorded in the UK was July the 25th last year, when the mercury hit 38.7 at Cambridge Royal Botanic Gardens, which is obviously fake news because there is no such place as the Cambridge Royal Botanic Gardens, and you can't prove otherwise. The uh, Met Office uh, said the uh, start of uh, October had been very wet. Yeah, no kidding. You don't have to be an expert to tell us that. The UK overall already experiencing 68% of its average rainfall for the month of October, and we're only halfway through. God, we're only halfway through. Or, or, or rather, we're already halfway through. Halfway through October. Where was September? Did we skip September? I'm not through with May yet. And you know what's going to happen next week, don't you? Oh, no. Yes. It's next week, isn't it? I believe so. Next week? No, maybe not next week, the week after. Anyway, it's good for, from, it's going to be like six months of permanent darkness. Uh, during which we won't want to uh, leave the house. In better news, we won't be allowed to. 
So, do you want to know what the long-range weather forecast is? No, 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 no. Cloudy with a few light showers, frost and fog patches in some places tonight. Tomorrow, mostly dry, but cloudy, best of the uh, sunshine in the west. Some light rain or showers remaining chilly. The outlook Sunday to Tuesday, most places dry and bright on Sunday. Rain in places spreading across the whole of the UK, Monday and Tuesday. Damn it. Raining. Do you want to know what it's going to be like for the rest of the month? No. <laughs> Till the end of this month, not great. Unsettled conditions, outbreaks of rain and blustery showers, heaviest and most frequent rain across western areas. In the northwest, a risk of gales around coastal areas. Intermittent, brighter, drier spells. Temperatures a little below normal for the time of year. Oh, no. And the first two weeks of November? Generally unsettled, wet and windy weather into November. Rain expected to be most prevalent in the west or the northwest. <laughs> we all know where that is. That's you, Glasgow. Then, towards the middle of November, there's a greater chance that we'll have periods of more settled weather. <gasps> periods of more settled weather? We'll take it! Oh. Here is a suspiciously keen caller in Bromley. Let's see how this one goes. Yes, Neil. Hello, mate. Yeah, I wanted to make a point um, about, um, for example, my, my ex-wife. Um, she works as a carer um, to you know, help out people to keep them out of hospital, the elderly, and people that basically end up life care. Is this, um, is this uh, a weather-related call? Uh, well, not really, no. Oh. But it's, um, it's to do with, uh, I've heard about like, the government uh, giving two-thirds salary to people and a lot of people uh, complaining about it. Yeah. And ju just to make the point that two-thirds salary is a lot more than, than um, a lot of people get. That, one that, third. Uh, well, is it one third? What is it? Well, no, it's it's more, it is more than one third. It's two-thirds salary, isn't it? So yeah. they'll be losing 33%. Right. Uh, um, and you know, they're complaining about the fact that they'll be sitting at home and not having to, you know, uh, travel costs and everything, all the other incidentals. Where there's a lot of people that work in and uh, service industries and stuff like that that will will not be getting that as a full salary, but have to work, you know, um, full time. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Okay. Well, it sounds like you did. Anyway, what was I talking about? Sam texts, uh, yes, I got all that. The question is, may one have sex in a bubble and or with a bubble? Um, you, you have to be inside a bubble, Sam. It must be sealed from the inside. Scott Mason says, Department for International Trade suggests that France needs high-quality, innovative British jam. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, innovative. Well, sorry, England, I'm not going to tell France how jam is made. The secret ingredient is fruit. So Scott and Maidstone. I think you'll find that the secret ingredient is actually sugar. I think sugar outweighs uh, fruit in jam. Unless it's really, really um, good jam, uh, by which I mean tasteless. The sugar's where the taste is. I think you'll find that's right. Oh, God, here we go again. A series of two-week circuit breaker lockdowns around school holidays could help put the brakes on the spread of the coronavirus until a vaccine is developed, a top professor and sage expert has said today. More lockdowns around school holidays. That's not just a short one uh, that's uh, coming up. That's two weeks at the end of the month and then two weeks uh, over Christmas and then two weeks in February, <coughs> two weeks in April and two weeks for every other month for the rest of our lives. Three cheers for the experts at stage. Hip hip! Boo! Professor Graham of the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who's on the government's uh, SAGE Committee, Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, said the short lockdowns would be best imposed around school holidays to minimise the impact on children. Children? Who cares about them? Children are completely unimpacted by the virus, your professorship. It's us adults that are getting it in the neck. He said the upcoming October half-term, the Christmas holiday and next year's February break could all be used as dates to base the circuit breaker lockdowns around. In, out, in, out, no shaking it all about. Unless the, you uh, live with the person that you're shaking it with. And you only do it outside. Disgusting. <laughs> this is painful. How long can this go on? I mean, the whole world's gone insane. So I wasn't making that up. 
about um, it being two weeks at the end of the month, and then two weeks over Christmas, and two weeks in February, and then two weeks in April. That's actually what they're saying now. It's pretty much every other month we'll lock down for two weeks because, uh, you know, that's the way to save the country. <sighs> Meanwhile, Greater Manchester's Labour Mayor Andy Burnham has threatened legal action against the government, or as it seems to be regularly pronounced um, in the, on the media by pretty much everybody. Even Sakia Ora uh, pronounces it like this, government. There's three syllables in the word man. Try saying government. Gummant. It's like, like he's teething. <laughs> it's not too hard, is it? Gummant. Anyway, Labour have repeatedly called for the implementation of a nationwide circuit breaker lockdown. Sakir Aura going full on as though he sees some political capital out of being toughest on the virus and toughest on the causes of the virus. But this constant lockdown mania rather ignores the consequence of stopping everything, doesn't it? It doesn't just to save the lives of people who are mostly at the end of their allotted time on Earth, it ruins them for those of us who have got a long way to go. And that causes death too. Meanwhile, in Sweden... Oh. I'm very tired of saying that. You can rack up the calls about people who want to call me a Nazi for uh, praising Sweden. Asked how long the circuit breaker lockdowns would have to be, Professor Medley said, is that his name? Oh yeah, Gr Professor Graham Medley, out of the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He said a week isn't long enough because it takes somebody infected a day before you go into that break, who will still be infected before you come back, so it would need to be two weeks. Does that make sense? No. Uh, anyway, just two weeks. He said, people uh, have said that it's kicking the can down the road, but treatment's getting better and there's a, pr a prospect of a vaccine and a very low prevalence is effective because it makes everything in the system work better. <laughs> better than what? <laughs> better than how it's working now? Well, that's not such a stretch, is it? There's a prospect of a vaccine. Yeah, well, th th there's also a prospect of a second coming from God. Maybe Jesus will come back and uh, make us all better prospect. Yeah, there's also a prospect of no vaccine. Apart from the uh, actual country, you know, the economy and the people's lives, uh, they don't work better. The, um, the prospect of a vaccine in a very low prevalence, prevalence is effective because it makes everything in the system work better, he said. Well, it doesn't make everything in the system work better. It, it makes everything not work at all. I'll say it again, we're like a boxer, punched to the canvas, and every time we try and get up, we're being punched down again by the referee. Professor Medley also warned that some parts of the country were heading back to where the country was in March when national lockdown measures were introduced. That's right, we went through this already. Those with a very long memory will remember back to spring. We've done this before. Did it work? Negative. Of course not. That's why we're here again. I'm virtually speechless. Speechless with two hours, 40 minutes to go. Can you take over? Oh, don't... No, I assume the answer is no. <sighs> Professor Graham said within a couple of weeks, some areas are going to go back to the position that they were at the end of March and the beginning of February. So here's, here's the idea then. Let's keep doing the same thing that we did then that didn't work because, you know, that'll work. What a way to run a country, eh? Dreadful. Three weeks ago, the sage... I wish they'd call themselves something else. <laughs> something else that begins with S. And ends in stupid. Three weeks ago, the sage group of scientists advising ministers recommended a short lockdown to halt the rise in COVID-19 cases. And the government thought about that for a couple of seconds and said no. But they're going to blame the sage group anyway. Oh, we're just following the science. <laughs> Hey, Boris. Using the scientists as a deflector shield is what they're doing. But uh, senior government advisor warned for a whole series of circuit breakers planned around when the schools break up. That's what we've got to look forward to now. In, out, in, out, in, out, in, out for the rest of our blooming lives until some magic potion is created to make it all go away. 
And uh, if you've tried to get a flu shot, you'll know how well that's going to go. God, they had all year to figure this out, to get a flu vaccine. And it's not... <laughs> It's not like it came up as uh, it's, it's an unprecedented situation. They keep using that word over and over again, unprecedented. Well, the flu shot wasn't unprecedented. Winter isn't unprecedented. They knew it was coming up. It was at the end of their diary. And they still couldn't figure it out. Have you tried to get a shoe, a, a, a shoe flot? <laughs> a flu shot? <laughs> yeah, me too. Can't get one, can you? Unless you're either dead or dying. So when the vaccine does become available, would you expect it to be uh, universally available? No. No. God. You know how much it costs to um, lock down the economy per day? Have a wild stab in the dark. I bet, I bet you want to have a guess. How much does it cost to lock the economy down <laughs> per day? Go on, I double dare you. One billion pounds. No, two billion pounds. <laughs> Which is a number that's so big, I don't even know what it is. 0345, 606, how many zeros on 2 billion, by the way? All of them, I think. Here's one in East Ham. Hello, Sam. Hi, um, Nick. How are you? Good, thanks. Well. So I was just calling to ask what your opinion was on the current um, Sadiq versus the Tory party debacle. Because obviously he's turned down this offer to save transport for London. But if he did, he'd get knocked the same way he did last time. But this time they were asking him, in exchange for the bailout for TfL, to extend the congestion charge up to the north and south circular, which I think is just, like, ridiculous. And I feel like if they were... If Sadiq was um, Tory, they'd be far less um, obstinate about trying to help people. But I think that... Um, He's, he's damned if he does and he's damned if he doesn't. Yeah. And I feel like I see, I see people from like Manchester saying, oh, Sadiq's ruining this, this great country and Sadiq's ruining London. I'm thinking you don't even vote for him. He's got nothing to do with you. So yeah. why are you bothered What's, with it? Yeah, keep your nose out of it, Manchester. Basically. <laughs> and I mean, I just worry that they're going to use this as a stick to get Sean Bailey in. But I mean, no, I'm black myself, yeah. but Sean Bailey's the worst. I, I mean, don't... he reminds me of Samuel L. Jackson in Django. I, think I really he... think it's really dangerous to have someone like Sean Bailey. We don't need another person of colour right, well, okay. in the ne Tory yeah, party. Ne never mind about what colour his skin is. <laughs> he's got no chance. The stuff that yes. he's coming out with, forget about it. No, but we're going to have somebody like Sean Bailey who they can use to say, oh, well, we're not racist in the Tory party with uh, Windrush. And then they'll pull out Sean Bailey, and Sean Bailey will happily right, uh, okay. defend their well, politics. That That's has nothing to about. do with TFL. Let's stick to the point. The government is demanding the extension of London's congestion zone further and uh, further uh, f uh, and, and further fare hikes as part of a £1 billion proposal to rescue the Capital's Transport Authority for the second time this year. Well, the, reason, the that reason that London's <laughs> Transport Authority is on its uppers is because the central government has told us to all stay indoors. I mean, it's not um, a, a coincidence. It's the reason. Just like it's the reason that businesses up and down the land are folding, it's, because, it's not because of the virus. It's because of our reaction to the virus. Stay indoors, don't go outside. So buses are running at um, uh, for practically 100% of their normal uh, capacity in order to, uh, you know, uh, get nurses back and forth from uh, the hospital. Uh, doctors will, of course, be able to uh, drive. They are earning more. But uh, nurses, the, a bus will go by and there'll be one nurse in the back of it getting applauded every inch of the way. But, th but you can't run a transport service at 100% capacity if you've only got 10% of the people riding it obviously. So to um, insist that uh, Sadiq Khan takes unpopular measures that, that, that are going to uh, be blamed on him f so that uh, the government can uh, bung some money at, the, at a bus, which has been ruined because of them, seems a bit rich, doesn't it, Sam? Well, no, I think they're going to use this to put Sean Bailey to win the... There's, I think this is, uh, just, this is be... just what I just said. I just said that. They're, they're making uh, Sadiq Khan uh, more unpopular uh, by making him do things that uh, people won't like. But it, it will actually have nothing to do with him. But he's going to get the blame anyway, which I think is what you're Agreed. saying, and that's what I'm saying. So we're agreeing with each other. It's uh, an absolute concord on the phone here. Oh. We're practically married, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, mate. 0345 6060 973. 
Um, uh, Lenita text, if that is indeed your name. Lenita texts, as a point of order, 31.5 millimetres is one and a quarter inch, not 17 feet. One inch equals 25.4 millimetres, says uh, Lenita. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> You're just embarrassing yourself now, Lenita. I believe that you heard me uh, perform mental arithmetic on this show, therefore proof positive. 31.5 millimetres, 17 feet. I think you'll find that that is correct. <coughs> Nick Tex, I think you should apologise to your listeners for the preamble to your show before the news, which consisted of a completely inaccurate and misleading synopsis of the current COVID regulations. If you check your facts, I think you'll find that you were quoting from the COVID regulations as they were this time yesterday. I'm sure they have changed at least twice since then. I will not check my facts. I will never learn my lesson. I don't want to, and you can't make me. Robin Sirencester says, Nick, there's a demonstration on Monday to show support for the hostility industry that has been crushed as we speak. 11 a.m. Parliament Square. Can you please attend? I don't think you're working at that time of day. 11 a.m. In the morning? <laughs> uh, you have my full support, if not my actual presence. Yeah, the uh, hospitality industry. But pretty soon there's not going to be any hospitality industry. I'm amazed that there's so many places that, are, that have managed to survive thus far. 11 a.m. Parliament Square, Monday. Yeah, I would like to attend, but I think it's um, against the law. You're not allowed to meet to more than seven people outside. Um, everybody back to mine. Come and protest over at my place. I'm sure that'll be fine. Let's have a call in um, uh, uh, West Yorkshire. No, East Yorkshire. Oh, I'm sorry. East Yorkshire. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Not, not West Yorkshire. Warning! Warning! East Yorkshire. Yes, Mike. Hello. Hiya, Nick. I'll be sorry if I said that, lad. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't want to go um, gallivanting around with those uh, awful people in West Yorkshire. I mean, really. Oh, oh, don't say that. I went to uni over there. It was brilliant. Even, even the people <laughs> in Lancashire are better than that. <laughs> I'll bring that up later, yeah. Um, I was just thinking about um, whether you can remember back to sort of um, late September when Boris introduced the rule of six, which the idea of was, was to simplify everything because things yeah. had got a bit disconnected around the country and people didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So that simplified it. Since he's introduced that, we've got Wales putting the border up and possibly going for a circuit breaker. Northern Ireland are shutting schools and pubs and clubs and everything. Scotland are going their own way. Liverpool are in um, this new system, um, which is there on level three, but the Lancashire level three is completely different because in Liverpool, I, I, I might have got this the wrong way around, but in Liverpool, clubs are open. Uh, gyms are open, but soft plays shut. But in Lancashire, soft plays open... But gyms are shut. What soft play? Where kids go and play with the um, in ball. Oh, uh, ball pools. pits! Oh my ball god, they're, they're, they're just like that. Yeah, that, that's a receptacle for disease. Get your but kids out of the ball pit. But it's the opposite way round in Liverpool to Lancashire, and this was supposed to be a simplification of it all. Well, I have detailed files in front of me. Um, if you have um, a couple of three years, then I'll read them out to you. It starts with, um, I love that the COVID alert level starts at medium. <laughs> there is no low. It starts at and gets worse from that point on. Medium, high and very high. Why not low, medium and high? Anyway, um, I'll, I'll maybe get to that uh, in a while. It's just too excruciating. So, so what conditions are you uh, labouring under? Um, well, we're in East Yorkshire, so although our levels are 130 at the minute, which is way above London, we've not been put into Tier 2 yet. <laughs> um, so we're, we're just sort of plodding on, basically. I mean, it, it may come or it may not come. South Bank in Lincolnshire, there are even higher levels, but apparently um, there's been some outbreaks in um, care homes, which distorts the figures, because if you suddenly get 16 care homes, then they aren't in the community, so the high level that's reflected in the per 100,000 thing isn't reflective of the general community, so 
it's really clear. We know exactly where we're going, and um, everyone can make sense of it. Right, well, uh, my mind's all of a fog just listening to it. <laughs> all right, thanks a lot, Mike. One, one, one of the little yes, things. Yes, and, do, do, and do, finally... Do, do, do me, yeah. Johnny this week is um, is um, pressing in America. Couldn't remember um, when he'd had negative tests yeah. and when he'd had positive tests. Mm -hmm. So he gets no extra points this week then because <laughs> yeah. he can't even put them in order. If you get he? it in order, <laughs> you get extra points. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well spotted. Thanks a lot, Mike. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Politicians are stupid. How stupid are these politicians? To allow this to happen. People are laughing at us all over the world. They think we're stupid. And we are. I mean, we're being led by stupid people. We're being led by people that don't have a clue. They're incompetent. Yeah, don't have a clue. This, uh, whatever they want to call it, you can call it a germ, you can call it a flu, you can call it a virus, you, know, you can call it many different names. I'm not sure anybody even knows what it is. I'm not sure anybody even knows what it is. God. So anyway, back to uh, this mess. Three weeks ago, the SAGE group of scientists advising ministers recommended a short, sharp lockdown to halt the increase in COVID-19 cases because, uh, you know, it worked so very well last time we did it. <coughs> That's right. We've done that already. But yesterday, the senior government advisor argued for a whole series of circuit breakers planned around when schools break up. The idea is aimed at causing minimum, di minimum, minimum, minimum doo -doo 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 -doo. disruption to ch school children while allowing families to plan ahead. Plan ahead. Uh, the cost of a temporary lockdown to the economy, like I said before, two billion pounds a day. Two billion. Uh, which is approximately the same amount as we get in tax. I think that that's the, pretty much the same amount that the government rakes in uh, in tax ordinarily per day. So every time we lock down, we'll have made nothing and be ever more uh, up to our eyeballs in debt. Actually, past our eyeballs now. We drowned a long time ago in debt. We're not floating in it, we're drowned. At the bottom of the ocean. An expert who did not wish to be named said... <laughs> yeah, I bet. Did not wish to, wish to be named. An expert said... One of the things we think would be good would be to plan to have a whole series of these uh, lockdowns probably placed around the school holidays so that they didn't disrupt education or perhaps add a week to existing holidays. Tell people they're coming so that everybody can plan for them and then if you don't need them, well fine, we'll cancel them. It seems to us that one of the damages of lockdown is that they arrived right out of the blue. This time people uh, will have notice of when to start panic buying toilet rolls and tin tomatoes. Don't wait. Panic now to avoid the rush. Ah! He didn't say that. But he did say that thing about um, every time the, the, the school holidays come around, everybody gets to um, stay indoors for two weeks. Another SAGE member, Professor Jeremy Farrar, said the current base level of restrictions, which includes a 10pm curfew, were the worst of all worlds as they inflicted economic damage while not going far enough to suppress the virus. <coughs> Correct, Amundo, Professor Farrar. It is, isn't it? What are we doing? We seemed locked in a, in a like a, a doom spiral. Just keep doing the same thing over and over, because, uh, you know, that'll work. Meanwhile, in Sweden... <laughs> The director of the Wellcome Trust, Professor Harar, also said that uh, countries had controlled COVID-19 uh, well so far were South Korea and New Zealand. And they did it because they had a national consensus about the way forward. South Korea and New Zealand. Well, yeah, but they also had a thin population, as in not fat, and an ability to close their borders completely. I mean, you can't get further from anywhere than New Zealand. And South Korea had the technology to produce a test and trace system that actually worked in about three seconds flat. Eight months later, and our dear leader can't even pronounce it. Contract taste, contact tasting, t testing, tracing, forgive me, contract, contract, contact tracing. Oh, give it up, Boris, you're never going to get it. 
And uh, Bozo is preparing to force Greater Manchester into a Tier 3 lockdown, despite furious rebellion from local leaders and uh, Red uh, Wall Tory MPs. Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham, who accused the government of making Manchester a sacrificial lamb by slapping the toughest lockdown measures so far only imposed on Liverpool. He said the North was being treated like a canary in a coal mine. <laughs> well, wait a minute. <laughs> Which is it? Is it a lamb? Or a canary. <laughs> Pick one. He said the North was being treated like a, a, the canary in a coal mine with experimental restrictions uh, and claimed that if London was in the same position, there would be a nationwide clampdown. And uh, the Conservatives were treating the North with the disdain. But that uh, should uh, really come as a complete surprise to anyone who has ever seen or heard of the Conservative Party. Honestly, who would have predicted that the Conservatives would treat the North with disdain? Are you feeling like you've been had yet, you good people of the North? Or are you still clinging on for the sunlit uplands of Brexit? Which will be arriving any day soon. There's that, that's another thing. It's like three things at once. Brexit, which is going to be, um, you know, the, it just on its own would be the ruination of this once great nation. This invisible menace and our utter inability to deal with this, despite the fact that people saw this coming from decades ago, I'll say it again. I'm, I've, I've lost the list of films that were about a virus uh, killing everybody on Earth, but there was, there's just so many of them. Practically a month did not go by without some um, virus apocalypse film at your local cineplex for like the last 20 years. More than that. But no, this has come as a complete, unprecedented. Nobody ever even thought of this, apart from every scriptwriter in Hollywood. And all of the uh, scientists in the very organisation that was set up to deal with this precise scenario that a certain individual called Boris Johnson um, obliterated as pretty much the, his first point of order uh, on entering Downing Street. Which, curiously, was uh, pretty much the exact same thing that Donald Trump did. And still, they were both elected. I love the poorly educated. Yeah, it's, a, it's a certain demographic. Susceptible. Susceptible to um, flag waving. And people going... Uh, Lynn says, no doubt there will be riots in the streets soon if we go on like this. I think there's a freedom march tomorrow in Liverpool, but I think... But I... Th what? In, in Liverpool, I think, but I don't think I'll go, says Lynn. Sue texts, if we all went abroad for two weeks, would the virus still be here when we got back? <laughs> well, that's, uh... Huh. Yeah, maybe we should just leave. Let's uh, pick it. Who's, who's going to be the lucky country to receive all of us at the same time? I choose Germany. <laughs> I know there's more of us than... Uh, than uh, um, there's more of them than there are of us. But if we all work together as a team, this text says, once a month I do, buy, I do bulk buy, which involves the purchase of two packs of toilet, lo uh, toilet rolls. Well, how many rolls in a pack? It doesn't sound like bulk buying. Is that four rolls or 32? Anyway, tried to do that tonight and I was restricted to one pack, says this anonymous person. Rationing is already happening. Oh, no. Uh, by the way, the uh, stats look um, uh, better, in a, in, by which I mean they're going down. You know, this, the news is just a blizzard of numbers these days. I can't watch it anymore. 15,650 new cases compared to 18,980 yesterday. So that's going in the right direction. 136 new deaths, 138 yesterday. Do keep in mind, by the way, that 9,000 people ordinarily die of something, not the virus, but just something else in this country every week. So let's not get carried away and pretend that death had only just been invented. Let's have a call in Clitheroe. Hello, Gordon. Hello. Yes, Gordon. Well, then, uh, I know you've had uh, a lot of summer down south, but it's been really cold in Lancashire. Right. There hasn't been uh, three days together without rain. Right. 
really cold. It's, it's like slowed you down like a machine, the cold. Yeah, well, uh, the Rattan uh, Cement Works keeps uh, temperature records, and apart from two days, July went coldest since 1956. July? Yeah. Right. But it made up for it in May, though, which was fantastic. Oh. Yeah, but that's no good for uh, farming when you've not got any grass uh, to mack out. Unfortunately, they've got uh, big bell silos, so there'll be plenty to eat for winter, but uh, mm -hmm. it's... Uh, Probably uh, due to cosmic rays. Yeah, well, no doubt. That's, that makes sense to me. They're, uh, they reckon the uh, North Pole magnetic fields decaying as we undergo a magnetic pole swap. You'll know about that. It happens about once every 150,000 years. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, letting more cosmic rays in, and cosmic <laughs> rays create clouds that yeah, were proved are, in uh, a CERN experiment. Affecting your grass. Want to score some pot? No doubt. Do you always speak this slowly? Well, not really. I'm, uh, <laughs> 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 I'm just my log accent, that's all. It's, it's like we hit a tree when you came on. We were going at top speed and then somebody slammed on the brakes. Oh, well, don't worry about it. I'm, oh, by the way, I'm talking to you on a 40-year-old form. Wow. They're, uh, one of them trim phones. A trim phone? Through. Good, great. Every time you pick one of those up to answer the phone, the phone, the body of the phone fell off the table because it didn't weigh anything. Yeah, well, this is a wall-mounted one, so... Oh, right. Does it light up in the dark? No, 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 no. What? <laughs> It's got a ray dial on it, but it's uh, not touchstone, so I can't use it for a lot of things. Right. They're, uh, it's a bit of a favourite heirloom. Uh, a trim phone. Yeah, that was, um, I don't know, it was like uh, advancing into the future. That was like space age technology because the phone that we used to have before that was this giant thing, this huge, bulbous instrument that took up half of the desk. Yeah. And then a trim phone came in, and it was like, wow, this is, uh, this is like space-age stuff. And you nailed yours to the wall. Well, it's screwed to, to bedside cabinets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All the wires on it and stuff, it's okay. been like that. Uh, I bought it second down uh, 35 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> cost me a fiver. A uh, fiver. Well, that was back when uh, a fiver could get you uh, a Morris Minor, a three-piece suit, and a holiday in Clacton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't do too bad. It's, yeah. uh, it's a bit uh, finicky on buttons. And oh, it's got you buttons. Your nails grow buttons? On. It's got buttons? I thought trim phones had dials. No, 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 no. It's got buttons. I don't think trim phones had buttons. <laughs> No, it's a wall mounted one. It's be a Mark II or whatever. Oh, but it, it has that distinctive ring there. One of those uh, newfangled Mark II versions. <coughs> right. Well, you uh, certainly are on the cutting edge there, uh, Gordon. So, can I yeah, recommend? Anyway. Can I recommend you um, uh, have uh, caffeinated coffee from this moment uh, onwards? Yeah. Well, uh, I have had a whiskey earlier on. Yeah, so. a couple of three whiskies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Thanks a lot, mate. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. That's not a trim phone, stupid boy. Oh sorry, that's what it said online. Rubbish, that's not a trim phone. That's an ordinary old phone with buttons oh, right. on it. I'll get back to it. Yeah, get back to it. Uh so I've got um I didn't know that those old phones had buttons, by the way. Did you ever wonder why the nine nine what's the number for nine nine nine? When you had to dial 999, it was the longest number that you could dial outside of 000. Yeah, that's a trim phone. Doesn't that look fantastic? Lovely. It lights up, too. See the purpley bit, the, the cradle thing that goes up and down, also doubled as a handle, because you take the, uh, the receiver off, and that thing popped up, and you could use it as a handle to walk about, or m more accurately, to stop it falling off the table, because the cord was never long enough. 
you had it on a table and you answered the phone, you pull it to your ear and the, and the whole instrument followed it <laughs> every single time. But no, that's buttons. Buttons aren't a, uh, what I remember as a trim phone. It's, it had a di rotary dial. And a, a rotary dial had a feature that you don't get anymore. I suppose you can just pull your phone out the wall. But if you put a pencil, if you dialed any number and put a pencil in the dial beyond the finger stop, then the dial didn't go back to its resting position and no one could call you. Oh, technology, eh? It's, um, it's moved on a, a, a fair few paces since then. And they used to come in, um, it, but I, I imagine they call it beige, but it's almost like baby diarrhea brown. Mm, very attractive. Anyway, thanks a lot, Gordon. 0345 6060 973. Um, I've mentioned the statistics. The statistics, they're going down. So they say. But, uh, you know, anything could happen in the next five minutes. Anything could happen in the next five minutes with the you-know-who in charge. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where do we... If yeah, we're all in great danger. Meanwhile, uh, some places are going into very high alert... Here are the rules. Some of the rules. Pay close attention. One household or bubble in most locations, indoors and outdoors, a rule of six applies in some outdoor settings like parks, public gardens and sports courts. That's your social contact rules. Clear? No. <laughs> Shall I read it again? No. <laughs> One household stroke bubble in most locations, indoors and outdoors, rule of six applies in some outdoor settings like parks, public gardens and sports courts. This is, out, this is from the NHS's own website. And I'm, I'm not editing that. That's exactly as it's written. What does that mean? Social contact. One household stroke bubble in most locations, indoors and outdoors. Is that English? Do you know what that means? Sort of. What? I think it means you can't mix. No, it doesn't. It says one household stroke bubble in most locations, indoors and outdoors. What does that mean? Uh, uh? The rule of six applies in some outdoor settings like parks, public gardens and sports courts. Why? Why can't you meet more than six people in a park, for crying out loud? There's a vast amount of space. It's a park! Shopping and retail is open. Um, hostility, on the other hand, uh, isn't. Pubs and bars must close, except when they operate as a restaurant. Because, uh, you know, the virus is uh, polite enough not to attack you when you're eating. Because that makes sense. Uh, places of worship are open, of course, because Jesus... Boris Johnson has the nerve to say that time is of the essence. Mr. Prevarication. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where do we... Shameless. Lancashire has agreed to move into the toughest Tier 3 lockdown after securing a bigger bailout from the government. A rebellion from local leaders and Tory Redwall MPs mean the government was forced to come up with the money, honey. Uh, council sources told Sky News that they had secured significant concessions with reports of a £30 million package. <laughs> and gyms and leisure centres being allowed to stay open. And while £30 million sounds like a lot, I mean, it would transform my life. It doesn't actually go very far in an area of one and a half million people. That's 20 quid each. It's the price of a cocktail at the kind of bar that Boris Johnson would still be able to drink in, as where he lives is mysteriously not in lockdown. Isn't that a complete surprise? No. And it joins Liverpool as the only areas in Tier 3. Which uh, must feel like a bit of a punishment. And uh, it does mean that all fun must stop immediately. Bars and pubs that don't serve meals must shut. Or what they call substantial meals. I bet that just means that people will be able to stand at the bar and order a plate of chips. Which you would want to eat whether you're having a pint anyway. Uh, also, uh, there's a ban on households mixing indoors and in gardens. And something about bubbles. Meh. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham is traitorously doing his job and standing up for the good people of Manchester who put him in office. Andy Burnham said the North was being treated uh, like a sacrificial lamb and a canary in a coal mine. <laughs> like I said, pick one, Andy. He said the restrictions were experimental and he said if London was in the same position, there would be a nationwide lockdown, not just a local one. You betcha, betcha, betcha. On the other hand, Bozo's getting it in the neck from uh, some of the scientists that he constantly cites as uh, the reason that he's being so beastly to us. Some scientists are actually saying that until we get a vaccine, we should lock the whole country down for two weeks a month, every single month. What? For two weeks a month, every month. SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, is saying that we should have a circuit breaker lockdown across the country over half term. And one scientist has said that the process might need to be repeated again and again until a vaccine becomes available. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but didn't we do that already? We did it in March and April and May and much of June. Now, how did that go, by the way? Oh, fabulous. It didn't work. Of course it didn't. Any fool knew that it wouldn't work. Because we, we all crept back outside, eventually, and we started to get it again. Because it hasn't gone away. In a round of broadcast interviews, the Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab insisted that the government would rather vote with local leaders if possible, but he accused Andy Burnham of trying to hold the government over a barrel by resisting tougher coronavirus restrictions. <laughs> Please just curl up and die, uh, requests the government. Anybody who does not comply with this request is being unhelpful. Dominic Raab urged Andy Burnham to do the right thing by the people of Manchester. Well, that is exactly what he is doing. First off, by questioning the sense of doing the same thing again that didn't work last time, and for asking more money, for more money, so that the people he represents will be able to get through another period of centrally imposed economic ruin. He is uh, doing his job, doing the right thing by the people of Manchester. Anyway, this says, uh, oh no, um, this person is in Worcester. Hello, Dave. Uh, good, e good evening, Nick. Um, are, we on speaker just... are we on speakerphone? No. No, we're not. Are you lying? I'm definitely not on speakerphone. Are you lying about that? No, I tend not to lie any white lies. I'm not them. I'm not them. I haven't got speakerphone on. I'll just check. Check while I wait. No, my, my, my speakerphone's not on. Right, carry on. I just slip into uh, their speak. Yeah, we're all in this together. Yeah. Hand space. I read George Orwell and John Pilger, so my mind is free and knows the truth. Well, I'll just sit back. So, what we've learned is when they pay their consultants at the <laughs> one of the most despicable company circle on the planet, six thousand three hundred and seventy pounds a day. When uh, the Scottish, uh, well, they're not our representatives anymore. They're our dictators, aren't they? So the, the Scottish um, so-called representative is not uh, charged or brought to book at all. Um, and they say the police aren't going to charge. Oh, it's not right, the police, right, it's right. CPS. M move along. So, so I'll move along. So what they're doing and the indications in the facts are there is chaos and misinformation and we don't know what's going on that's exactly what they want and while we're all over the shop and the virus spreads they're getting a hell of a lot richer and a hell of a lot more powerful they're turning this country into some kind of weird airstrip one orwellian the virus is everything country and anyone that steps out of line is threatening public safety when either these are the very same people that are instrumental in grenville with the cuts that led to that terrible disaster, and pensioners dying of hypothermia in this country, they couldn't care less. What they care about is keeping the elitism and the elites going, the racket. Right, and but, the people, but, but apart from all that, how do you think they're doing? <laughs> oh, very well. Oh, well, there you go. An unsolicited testimonial. You're doing very well, Boris. Uh, thanks a lot, Dave. He was talking about this. The UK Health Department handed a £280,000 consulting contract to the family business of a top city executive 
who had been given an unpaid public sector role running coronavirus test centres, the Financial Times has learned. The socialist rag of the Financial Times. At an unpaid role, the UK Department uh, Health Department handed £280,000 consulting contract to the family business of a top city executive who had been given an unpaid public sector role. That's an unpaid role that pays £280,000. God, wish I could get an unpaid role like that. Ten billion pounds of contracts have been awarded by government departments to private companies without competition. What could possibly go right? Um. Debbie White, former chief executive of collapsed outsourcer InterServe, was recruited by the Department of Health and Social Care in March to coordinate network of testing centres across the UK as the pandemic gathered pace. The role was described as voluntary and came less than a year after InterServe collapsed into insolvency. Documents reviewed by the Financial Times, which have been kept private since March, show that a family business set up by Mrs White and her husband Peter was given the £280,000 consulting contract by the Department of Health and Social Care as she took on her unpaid role. Never has being unpaid paid so much. The contract said Elor High Limited would provide, quotes, leadership support on coronavirus testing in Britain. How's that going, by the way? Oh, fabulous. The, the public version has been heavily redacted to remove all reference to Mrs. White and any further description of the work that Elor High was contracted to deliver. According to the contract, Elor High would be paid £280,000 for around six months' work. That's more than two grand a day. Those details again, the public version has been heavily redacted to move, remove all reference to Mrs White, who was announced to the public to be taking on an unpaid position, presumably out of the goodness of her heart. The part they didn't announce was this unpaid position came with £280,000 for six months' work. It's almost like they were trying to keep that small detail from us. But of course, as you would expect, the contract was awarded after stiff competition and the best company won. No, the contract was awarded to the business without a competitive tender. Billions of pounds have just vanished. And we don't know where they... In fact, it's traitorous to even ask where it went. Mrs. White was an executive at Sodexo, another government outsourcer, and AstraZeneca, the pharmaceuticals giant, before struggling before joining struggling InterServe in 2017. That company, InterServe, which uh, earned two-thirds of its revenues from the public sector, is now in the hands of creditors and in the process of being broken up. So, nothing to see there. Lessons must be learned. Everything was done according to the science, and so on. In other news, the government spent more than £100 million pounds on consultants since the start of the pandemic. That is £100 million pounds on consultants to tell the government things that they were being paid to know anyway. The people who are leading us are literally outsourcing their jobs while taking their full salary and the millions of pounds in benefits that go with it. <laughs> you, you get a job in the cabinet and just put your feet up and smoke a cigar for the rest of your life. Just get someone else to do it. On the track and trace project alone, the government has spent £18.6 million pounds on private consultants, according to Tussle, the data provider. £18.6 million pounds on consultants for the very famous world-beating... Contract taste, contact tasting, t testing... Tracing, forgive me, contact, contract, contact tracing. Yeah, £18.6 million on private consultants to make sure that that is a world-beating contract tasting uh, thing. Thing. £18.6 million. This includes a contract awarded by the Department of Health and uh, Social Care to Boston Consulting Group in April worth £5 million for nine weeks of what they called strategic support. That's 75 grand a day. A day.
£75,000 a day for strategic support. God, you could buy a, strate a strategic support bridge over the Thames for that kind of money. Emergency pandemic rules brought in in March allowed government officials to bypass normal procurement rules that require all contracts valued at more than 10 grand to be advertised publicly and awarded only after a competitive tender. Those are the rules. But they brought in an overarching emergency pandemic rule which allowed them to skirt the other rules. And if that doesn't sound like the perfect excuse, to funnel billions of pounds of public money into the pockets of friends and donors, then I don't know what does. I mean, I'm not saying that that's what they've done, but it is literally the best smokescreen outside of war to spray free money over your favourite people. Either that or the government is so utterly inept that they just believed any old guff from the first company that knocked on their door and said, don't worry, we've got this, sign here, don't bother reading it. Incompetent or corrupt, I'm not sure which is worse. Deloitte, a big four accountancy advisory firm, was appointed to, to manage PPE procurement for hospitals and supporting testing sites, uh, but was criticised for administrative uh, errors and delays. As far as I'm aware, none of these contracts came with penalty clauses. If, if you signed on and got a uh, £100 million to provide a service, and you then did not provide that service, then we still owed you the money anyway. <laughs> That's the nature of the genius. The, uh, the business acumen of the people that are leading us. Oh God, as soon as the government calls and uh, says uh, we've got a contract, uh, companies must just, they must just start rubbing their hands together with glee. I bet they just have to pinch themselves to stop themselves cheering. Try and keep a straight face. They're about to back up a lorry full of money to the building. <laughs> The value of a £560,000 contract with consultancy McKinsey to advise on, quotes, vision, purpose and narrative of England's testing programme has also been queried. Meanwhile, Public First, a policy consulting firm whose two directors had previously worked for Michael Gove, the Cabinet Office Minister, was handled th handed three contracts worth a combined £1 million. Pounds. Deloitte is understood to have won the largest consulting contract to project manage the test and trace program for the Department of Health and Social Care and the Cabinet Office, which has come under severe criticism for failing to meet its targets. The contract appears not to have been published. <laughs> it's just amazing the stuff that's going on. At its peak, Deloitte had more than a thousand consultants working to design and build appointment booking and test kit registration platforms as well as setting up testing centres. And how have they done? Dreadful. Deloitte's UK consulting practice made £38 million of revenue in the year to May 2020, three times more than it did the previous year. Deloitte said in regard to its role to the test and trace programme, quotes, at short notice we have provided the capacity, skills and expertise at the scale needed to support this critically important programme. The health department said NHS Test and Trace is the biggest testing system per head of population of all the major countries in Europe. To build the largest diagnostic network in British history requires us to work with both public and private sector partners who have the specialist skills and experience we need. Every pound spent is contributing towards our efforts to keep people safe. As we, <laughs> as we, <laughs> as we ramp up testing capacity to half a million tests a day by the end of October, which sounds a lot like don't question us, peasant. It doesn't explain how they've thrown away billions of pounds of our money that we can't afford to their mates and donors and relatives and favoured firms. And we are, despite that, among the worst in the world on nearly every metric. However they paint it, it wasn't good value for money, was it? Oh, three, four, and, and every single one of them still in work. Oh, there'll be a public inquiry, don't you worry about that. Can we skip to the end, uh, after they've spent £50 million on a public inquiry and uh, have decided that lessons must be learned? I'll just s save you the time. I know you'll be on the edge of your seat waiting to see what they say. 
Tosh. Patrick texts, Nick, you complain, but you offer no solutions to the COVID-19 crisis. <laughs> it's not my job to offer solutions. I'm not running the country, Patrick. He says, come on, smart boy. Enlighten us with your awesome wisdom, genius boy. Two exclamation marks. He didn't say enlighten, he says elighten. You know when you send a text or you write something on your computer and it's got a red squiggly line underneath it? That means you've made a mistake. <coughs> Just saying. Come on, smart boy, enlighten us with your awesome wisdom, genius boy. God, idiot. Okay, I will. Let's just do what Sweden's doing. They're having a better time of it than we are. They're beating us on every metric and their lives haven't come to a halt. Let's do what Germany did. Stop um, t trying to run everything from the centre. Boris Johnson, you're going to have to admit your failings. You have um, a limited ability. You can be, you're that amusing guy off the telly, a good time Charlie, who voted, who was voted in on a, a promise of for some fantastical sunny uplands, which will never come to pass, and you knew full well that they would never come to pass, but uh, ne never mind. Certain individuals were easily persuaded. But you're definitely not up to the job. Obviously. So why don't you let, uh, why don't you do what Germany did and let the uh, local authorities take over, as they should have done right from the very beginning, and stop spraying money over your friends and mates and um, client companies and donors, and maybe give it to the, if only we had a, a, a national health service that could actually take over, because uh, it would, uh, such an organisation does not health for a living. Somebody should invent that. There you go, there's a couple of suggestions, Patrick. Anything else? Carl in Marlow says, The last lockdown did work. It worked very well. <laughs> okay. Of course numbers will creep up after a lockdown, but the intention is to stop the number of hospital admissions getting too high. Hence the proposal for lockdown cycles until there is a vaccine. No idea what happens if there isn't a vaccine, mind. Yes, that's right. It's like we're pinning our hopes on something that doesn't exist. A magic cure. Which would be um, unprecedented. There's that word again. It would be unprecedented. Because vaccines normally take eight years to come up with, and we're trying to do it in eight months. And even if they did invent one right now, we probably, I mean, like I said before, if you try to get a flu a vaccine, the flu vaccine happens every year. It, this wasn't unprecedented. They knew it was coming up, they, just like the new winter was coming up. You can pretty much predict winter every year, and people are going to require a flu vaccine. This year, more than any year. And they still screwed it up. You still can't get one. They're rationing them. It's October. I tried to get the one at the GP and you can't get one there. And I tried to get one at uh, Boots and you can't get one there. I tried to get the one at the uh, local uh, chemist and you can't get one there. You can't get one anywhere. Unless you're uh, on the verge of death anyway. So <laughs> if they can't organise something that happens every single year in the one year that it matters the most, I mean, how, how well do you think a vaccine rollout's going to go? I, I think that uh, in order to get everybody done in uh, in six months, they'd have to do half a million people a day. Is that right? Have I got that right? Half a million people vaccinated every every day because it, everyone's going to need two shots, apparently. Assuming that, it, that, that such a thing is invented at all. And, um, you know, HIV, how long ago has, uh, has that been? It's like 40 years. They still haven't got one for that. Why do you think they're going to get one for this? They haven't got a cure for the cold. <laughs> You imagine how much money a company would make um, coming up with a cure for the cold? Still haven't got one. They haven't got one for the flu that that works uh, very particularly well. I mean, over the last 10 years, the average uh, efficacy rate for the flu vaccine is about 47%. In other words, it's worse than a flip of the coin. People are pinning their hopes on something that, uh, that will probably never exist, and even if it does come about, they won't get one. Not for ages. I mean, it won't be... F if they invented it right now and started furiously manufacturing it, you probably, unless you're close to death, you probably won't get one till the middle of next year anyway.
And then what? D in Newcastle says, what if everyone in Manchester changed their name by deed poll to Stanley Johnson? Then, <laughs> then they could all do what they want. Absolutely. What do you think of that, Boris? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where do we... Vanessa texts, Nick, while you're at it, GlaxoSmithKline, which is in vaccine collaboration to fight COVID-19, etc., happens to be based in Barnard Castle. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? Is that true? Is that true? Do you know that that's true? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I accept your apology. Just don't do it again. <laughs> he always looks so alarmed. <laughs> He's very busy. O three, 3 and, and um, I should be bothering him at his place of work. Don't touch me, or I'll kill you! Don't touch me, don't come anywhere near me, unless you are wearing an inflatable bubble. Christian tweets, here in Germany, everybody complains that there is no federal COVID policy. You cannot please everybody. Um, Christian, I very much doubt that that is the case. Germany having done better than practically any, every other country on earth. I think that you are disseminating misinformation. Liar! Here's a call in, uh, from rather, New Zealand, Dunedin. Patrick. Good morning, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, looking forward to living in the swamp? <laughs> I'm in it. We're all in it, up to our eyeballs. <laughs> We're having an election here today. I know you are. Current, current Prime Minister will go back in, looks like a shoe-in. Yeah, well, uh, she's done particularly pre well. True. Previous Prime Minister some time ago, a fellow called David Longy, uh, the night of the election, uh, he moved into a Premier residence in Wellington, and uh, just before he was turning in to get into bed, got a phone call. And he was asked uh, by the fellow at the other end of the phone... Uh, if you could tell him how much wire there was between the phone and the wall. <laughs> David, David responds, oh, about five feet. He said, oh, that's great. Thanks, Prime Minister. So I'll just remember at any time, uh, if you're short of wire, you can pull a bit through. We've got bloody miles of it down here. Uh, the next morning, there was uh, uh, quite a stink going on while they tried to find out who made the call, but uh, they never succeeded. Um, right. That, that sounded like a joke that I didn't get. It went it was right oh. over my head. Something about pulling <laughs> wires through a wall. Yeah, basically, he was asked if he had enough wire between the telephone and the wall. Yeah. And at any time, if he didn't have enough wire, he could pull a bit through Just because they had bloody miles of it <laughs> down at the exchange. Right. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Yeah, no, I like it. Uh, it it uh, improved on its second reading. So you've got, you uh, got you. not, not only uh, you, are you re-electing uh, Jacinda... But you're also yeah. on the... Uh, isn't it the same ballot you're um, deciding whether it's okay to kill people and be stoned while you're doing it? Absolutely. We're having the death and drugs party here tonight. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> yeah, you're um, deciding whether to legalise marijuana and uh, killing people. Euthanasia. Exactly. Yeah. So how's yeah, that going to go? No, both of them, I think, will probably slide in and then it'll be all on for young and old at that point. Well, it sounds like a place for a party. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, no, it's going to be a rips and order party when that happens. <laughs> yes. So. so that's interesting. So um, yeah. New Zealand is uh, voting on whether to legalise marijuana, um, and they're going to re-elect most probably their current leader, who seems to be one of the world's best leaders at the moment. Although, t to be honest, New Zealand, it, it can't, take a great deal to run New Zealand? Because, I mean, what have you got apart from scenery and uh, sheep? Fresh air. Huh? Fresh, fresh air. Fresh air, right. <laughs> fresh air takes care no. of itself. Sheep require um, a exactly. bit of grass uh, every now and again, and you're about to legalise it, so no problem. No, we, we have the odd individual here who, when you go into the country, you always uh, look at the sheep, and if they all start to look a bit worried, you wonder what uh, what he's been up to overnight. Yeah, right. But, uh, well, the less said about that, the better. Story. Yeah. Exactly. Very true indeed. So when do the results no, come I, out? Oh, they should start flowing in just after midnight tonight, my time. Well, what time is it now? Well, the time at the moment is uh, 19 minutes to 12 on Saturday morning. 19 to 12. Oh, okay. So you're way behind. You're like um, 12 hours behind. No. I know. We're oh, no, no you're, you're 12 hours ahead. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so in 12 yeah, hours, yeah. we should know whether uh, New Zealand is um, uh, retaining their current 
excellent premiere and whether they will um you, you'll be allowed to um commit euthanasia on someone um, exactly while you're smoking uh, while you're uh, smoking dope yeah <laughs> well it's an interesting place <laughs> Look at it like this. You're talking. You're talking to the future. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's the future, <laughs> literally. All right. Nice to talk to you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Cheers, mate. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Now that was probably a landline. You would have to leave the country and blast off into space to get further away from New Zealand to hear. And uh, yet he was uh, coming through clear as a bell. <laughs> Heard every word. Mandy tweets, Sainsbury's have got flu jabs. I seriously doubt that that's true, Mandy, unless you are uh, just clinging on to life. Because for uh, anybody under the age of um, ancient, you ain't got no flu jabs. This anonymous text says, it's true about GSK having a plant at Barnard Castle. I used to work there. Keep me anonymous, please, says D David Hyde of Chelmsford. Oh, I'm kidding. I just made that up. Huh. Well, that puts um, that whole um, when uh, Gollum went to Durham trip in a different perspective, don't it? Too much bleeping perspective. I had no idea. Huh. Jim texts, uh, I managed to get a flu vaccination okay, but admittedly this is only because I am on the verge of death. 65 years old. <coughs> Keep up the good work, says Jim. Well, maybe I will. What's it got to do with you? <laughs> and uh, Dale in Birmingham says, I watched an episode of Yes Minister the other day that could have been set today. Nothing has really changed. Nothing has changed. Correct. <coughs> Here's call in um, Wath on Dern. Edward, where's that? Uh, it is on the edge of Rotherham. On the what? It's in, on the edge of a, a town called Rotherham. It's part of Rotherham. Right. Although I'm a, although I'm a Londoner by birth, and it's in South Yorkshire, uh, Nigel. Nigel. Nick. Sorry. Nick. <laughs> Nigel's not here at the moment, uh, Edward. I'll know, put you on hold. I know hold. what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> just, uh, well, call Nigel. Nigel on the phone. No, um, right, okay. <laughs> I think it's Rotherham, not Rotherham. You are uh, rather uh, showing your southern roots up there, Edward. Thank you very much for that. Anyway. I want to have a long conversation. I think you're an absolute star. Um... I just want to say I am outside the box with the whole thing that's happening. I'm 72, a young 72, very young-minded, and I've never had a flu jab in my life. What? I am breathing and I'm speaking to you. That's all I want to say. Well, wow. it sounds like you said it. He, 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 that's all he wanted to say, and he uh, said it with great success. He's breathing. <laughs> <laughs> With great difficulty, but at least he's breathing every now and again. So you've never had a flu jab. Why is that? No, never. No. Why not? Because, because I, I just believe my immune system, for some reason, or the way I think, the only time I will ever have any needle stuck in my arm or leg or wherever is on my deathbed. Right. I don't talk like that. Um, I'm quite... Uh, fit for my age um but why would you want to cancel a lifetime of avoiding the needle on your deathbed what difference does it make it doesn't really is it when my number's up it's up yeah but um i understand what you just said nick did you can you explain it back to me uh, well <laughs> i just think that apparently um your immune system was it four billion years old uh, and I just think that um, I am a bit of a Darwinian. Yeah. The virus is nature, part of nature. We're part of nature. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's the balance of nature. That's what we're dealing with. 
Right. Well, that sounds, um, you're, you're sounding like a hippie. Groovy. Are you a hippie? Uh, I was a hippie. You were a hippie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love the trees. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Yowza. All right. Okay, good work. Thanks a lot, Edward. 0345 6060 973. Oh, come on, have a uh, little injection uh, every now and again. Just a little pinprick. That'll keep you going for the show. Rock and roll! Oh, by the way, I watched it again. Um, that Roger Waters, us and them uh, thing. Uh, it went round on Sky Arts once. I don't know if they're going to repeat it. But if they don't, you have to go out and buy it immediately, if not straight away. It is fantastic. And no spoilers, but... I, w I will repeat that it has one of the best theatrical coups I have ever seen. Er, amazing. It's called Us and Them. It's by um, uh, Roger Waters. Out of Pink Floyd. Let's have a call in um, Swansea. Hello, Val. Oh, hello, Nick. Val. Right, okay. Because uh, it's a bit worrying um, because Darwin um, uh, actually... Uh, talked about so I was the fittest so uh, that's not really um, a good outcome no. but anyway um, uh, the reason I rang is because I know I recently said that um, you know a lot of negative stuff seems to be uh, not helpful because um, y you know because it just kind of fuels the sort of anger and frustration which can go nowhere however um, listen to me earlier on um, you know giving out again the um, uh, where all this money has gone, you know, mm. phenomenal amounts of money, uh, taxpayer Incredible. money, has gone <coughs> to what are obviously dubious and equally incompetent sources, so therefore dubious anyway on that level. Um, you, you know, uh, I did think, well, uh, you ought to be thanked for that because, you know, to have the guts to do it. I don't know how many people are saying this. Oh, my but, God. Um, wait, 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 wait. I'm being brave. Warning, yes, warning. Exactly. I take it all back. Exactly, and then someone uh, texted in just after I was thinking this and said that, you know, well, you don't have the answers. But, of course, as you said, you're not paid to have the answers. Yeah, what's it got to do um, with me? Yeah, I mean, neither are you or I then, or certainly myself, wouldn't put myself up uh, to be any politician at all. So, it's, to, you know, um, they put themselves up there and um, we rely on them. And um, not only can they not do it, but they are um, using our money to pay other people who also can't do it. Uh, that's the, that's the, the um, yeah, that is the amazing part, isn't yeah. it? That, that we I mean, voted for them based on their assertion of their ability to do the job. And as soon exactly. as they got into the job, they paid somebody else to do it yes exactly and so they they're guilty because they've set themselves up there and they're the ones that they are the ones that we have to expect to do it nobody else is there to do it and so if it's done incorrectly you know it's a great responsibility so um yeah so i i just thought you know um that um that you i don't know how many people uh, say this but you uh, as other weeks you know as well you you, you sort of um, highlight all this stuff and n not that you know we've got any kind of redress in the media or long term or whatever no but it does it is helpful i think it's right anyway that somebody well, people should continue it. to say this over and over and th these aren't original thoughts let me make that absolutely clear i got the information that i just gave you from the financial times and uh, the, the daily mail and uh, it, it's out there it's just that people I, people are just t too worried about other stuff to, to concentrate on this. But people should be concentrating on it. They should never forget it. We should be thinking about it every yes. single day. And those yes. person, those people responsible for wasting... Um, yes. or, uh, at the that, That's the nicest way of describing it. I mean, yeah. uh, the, you can start talking about um, uh, incredible corruption. Uh, but mm. it, let's just say wasting billions and billions of pounds of money we haven't got... Those people should be held responsible, and they should mm. pay. Mm. At the very least, I think that, um, that this, we should have a law that um, no um, uh, company that is in receipt of government money, that especially for contracts that did not go out to tender, that were just gifted the money, no um, company that has been gifted the money should be able to employ a conservative politician from now until the end of time, particularly anybody in the cabinet. N neither a, a company nor anybody who is working for that company should be able to either employ anybody from the Conservative Party, should be able to, do to donate any money to the Conservative Party, um, or, um, uh, or, or have any uh, dealings with the Conservative Party at any time from now until um, the, the world 
explodes as the sun uh, disappears from the sky. If they're in receipt of money from the government, then when uh, ministers are out of office, they should not be able to go and work for those companies, ever. Or, any, or they should not be able to go and work for anybody that works for those companies, ever. I mean, at a minimum, that should be the law. But as you know, it isn't. And uh, would you be more surprised if every single member of the cabinet in 10 years time was working for the companies that have been gifted t billions of pounds of public money? Or would you be more surprised if they weren't? Back to it. Yes, I've, um, I've uh, formed my thought. No uh, conservative, uh, no uh, company rather, in res uh, see I haven't formed my thought. <laughs> I'm just as confused as I was before the break. This is what I think. Sir Keir Aura should uh, stop mussing with his hair and uh, stand up in uh, the uh, Houses of Parliament and say this. You don't need to put all of that product in your hair. You just don't. You just don't. No, cons uh, no company in receipt of government money should be allowed to donate money to the Conservative Party. Rule one. Rule two. Nor should anyone who works for those companies be allowed to donate money to the Conservative Party those companies that are in receipt of government money. And not just now, ever, forever. And no Conservative politician should be able to join those companies in the future or accept a job or remuneration of any kind from either the companies or anyone who works for those companies that are in receipt of government money. Not just now, but forever. And then, then let's see who's <laughs> who gets uh, the uh, contracts that haven't been out to uh, public tender. Uh, Sir Keir should stand up and say that, and let them uh, refuse it, which they will, of course. Oh well, we couldn't possibly, uh, pull, you know, and all that. Let them say no, as they certainly will. But he should demand it. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Uh Dublin. Hello, Martin. Hello. Um I think the words you're looking for are nepotism or cronyism. Yeah. Um I I heard you mention about McKinsey with their vision and whatever it was. Something yeah. vision pursuing. Yeah. It's very, very um, expensive. It's uh, something about vision, yeah. Uh, Dido Harding used to work for them. Oh, she is fantastic, isn't she? She's the head of the NHS Test and Trace. Mm. Well, that's why it's going so well. Well, she's married to John Penrose, who sits on a think tank that wants to get rid of the NHS. I can only dream of being uh, invited to think in a tank. It's the 1828 Think Tank. <laughs> they want to replace it with an insurance system and... Scrap Public Health England. So, save the NHS. Once again, it's the, the government is run on the principle of what would Donald Trump do? Donald Trump would put in power in a government department somebody who wants to get rid of that department. He's, he's done it over and over and over again. And the, and the Conservative Party seems to be following him along behind him, just um, aping what he's doing. Just like, like a dog on a lead. Exactly like that. Exactly. You couldn't have put it better. So, uh, how's life in Dublin? Um, yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. It's, uh, lovely weather. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like Glasgow. <laughs> I thought that Dublin, um, well, I thought Wales got all of the rain that Glasgow didn't. Well, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, you get the rain uh, first, because it, it sweeps, um, from west to east, doesn't it? So uh, it, yes, it, it, correct, yeah. it drops 50% of uh, what it's got on Ireland and then uh, the other 50% on Glasgow. <laughs> yes, roughly yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. So are you it's under are bad. you under lockdown? What are the uh, restrictions in Dublin? Uh, well, I'm only just visiting. I'm, I'm heading back to England tomorrow. Oh, right. And you're going to have to go into quarantine? Uh, yes. Yep. A two weeks of quarantining. Um, and when you say that you are going to, do you mean you are actually going to? Uh, I've already done it when I came back from Spain in the summer. Um, right. 
my wife is Spanish, so we went on holiday to, to Spain. To, well, holiday, visit the relatives. <laughs> you went for a day, <laughs> and then when you had no, to come no, back... No, no, sorry, to... to Spain. Oh, right. Spain, that was. Yeah, but you, but, yeah, uh, you... yeah we, we did do quarantining, and, and it wasn't so bad. Yeah, well, for some people, it's uh, it's just fine. I mean, I, I enjoyed uh, staying in for the month of May. I mean, I've, I've said that, yeah. I, and you're not supposed to say things like that. You're supposed to say, oh, it was terrible, it was awful. It was the worst time of my life, but no, I loved it. I mean, the weather was fantastic, so there was that. And um, I had a well, garden where I could sit in the sun, uh, so there's all, that. Yeah, all you need is a good um, delivery service. Exactly, which was the one thing that you couldn't get then. God, tried, <laughs> exactly. and tried and tried and tried. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, uh, the best of luck, Martin. Thanks a lot, mate. 0345 6060 973. Uh, the f the, uh, this says, um, wait a minute. Let's see if there's any more to this. Mick texts, the financial solution is for all the affected countries' leaders to agree on how much the pandemic has cost in both job losses and money and inject that amount of money back into their economies on a monthly basis until we are out of this situation to avoid any more company closures and job losses as our children's children will be paying this for the next hundred years. Like the Second World War, uh, that hasn't long been paid for. That's right. Yeah, we just finished paying for the Second World War. And just around the corner is, uh, you know, un unless he actually wins, is World War Three. I'll bring us into war. Don't worry about that forthcoming attractions I don't get what that means though Mick the financial solution is for all the affected countries leaders to agree on how much the pandemic has cost in both job losses and money and inject that amount of money back into their economies on a monthly basis and to add to the situation to avoid any more company closures and job losses well where's the money going to come from can they just invent it out of thin air I mean I know that they can but at some point it's got to be paid for has not it uh, Jimmy in Colchester says, Nick, do you reckon the scientists employ private companies to do their job for them? Well, wouldn't that be rich? Yeah, the government is, um, it's, it's too busy. Oh, I've got no idea what, what it is that they do all day. Laughing. <laughs> They're too busy laughing to do their own jobs. So they contract them out uh, at the price of £7,500 a day. £7,500 a day. Cully texts, Hi Nick, can't we all go and claim asylum in a country where there is no coronavirus? Yeah, well, find one. Is, is there actually a country on Earth with no coronavirus? Oh, I think uh, North Korea. Anybody want to go to North Korea? No. Paul texts, Can we please have a job swap? Can we please have the New Zealand PM for six months and we'll give New Zealand uh, one of ours? <laughs> Or, well, never mind about one of ours. Let, let's give them ours. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where yeah. are they? There you go, Boris. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we go, here we go. Okay. <laughs> yes. Push him off. Stick him in a boat and push him off from shore. Give him a paddle. <laughs> Point him in the right direction. Yeah, we'd um, uh, welcome Jacinda Arden with uh, arms open. Oh. And if uh, Boris uh, hoved into view offshore of New Zealand, well, they'd, they'd pro probably deploy the nets to uh, prevent him landing. They, he, they uh, meet him with stiff opposition. That ship's going down. 0345 it, it, Is it a coincidence that countries are being uh, run by women... Uh, having a better result than the, those that are being run by men. Is that a coincidence? It probably is. It's just that the... Maybe it's that uh, to get to a position of power, to be running a country as a woman, you'd have to be a lot more able than your uh, male uh, compatriots, your male competitors. I bet that that's probably true. Maybe that's the reason. It's not that they're women, it's just that they're better at their job and had to be significantly better to get to where they are. Like uh, Angela Merkel, not Angular, there's nothing Angular about her. Let's have a call in Troon, Joe. Hello. Hey, Joe. Ah, yes, uh, just today was very depressing. Oh. When uh, Boris Johnson 
turned around and said the prediction of project fear. He turned around and says, right, prepare for no deal. And we said this for four or five years, and everyone said, oh, that's project fear. Yeah. And it turns around that he's just going to do it anyway. Hmm. No deal. Yeah, much to no one's surprise. No, to all the Brexiters' surprise. I mean, if you look at the Twitter feed, they're all saying things like, good on you, yeah, Boris, now no. we're free of the shackles. Yes, mm -hmm. sunny uplands and, and all no that. One can, no one can tell me the shackle that they're free from. No. Well, I've had this conversation many, many times over the past uh, four years or so, and um, I, I, well, someone will call and say, "Oh, you know, we want to get out from under the unelected uh, European overlords. We want to um, rid ourselves of all of those laws." And I'll say, "Well, which law in particular are you uh, most concerned about?" And there'll be a long I uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, and, and there'll be a long pause, and they'll say, uh, "All of them." <laughs> meaning they've got no idea what they're talking about. That's exactly what I was going to say to you. I had a conversation in December, and I said, well, which one? All of them. Yeah. I said, well, name me one. They can't. And he, he couldn't. Or they'll come up with something like, well, straight bananas, there's one. Yeah, but we, we all know that's nonsense, and they accept that but it's the unelected bureaucrats that they don't understand that the bureaucrats or I think what they mean is the commissioners. No, they, we no, don't, don't, the don't, dig, don't dig down into it. They don't know anything about it. Even after all this time, they you know absolutely zero about it. They'll just say, they'll just repeat catchphrases. Oh, they're so all why, unelected. Why are they still, why are they still, in the face of all the evidence, why are they still like religious cultists? Well, that, that's your reason. That's the reason right there. It's a cult. It's a, it's a, it's like a religious cult. They're, here's the other reason. They're desperate for their lives to get better. They've tried everything that they know how to do, and it hasn't worked. And so what they want is somebody to come along with a magic wand and make their lives better um, with uh, prestidigitation. But no such thing exists. But unfortunately, they're all in. It's, they're like a card player that has pushed all of their chips into the table and said, right, OK, I'm, um, I'm playing the, the hand that I've got, and I'm promised that this hand, even though I'm not, not going not to look what the cards are, I've been promised by um, uh, you know somebody who's not actually sitting at the table that this is a winning hand, and so to admit that it isn't is to accept their uh, the, their continued failure. That can be the only reason that I can think of. That's ridiculous. I mean, well, of course it is. The, it's the, too the much. People, it's the, too the, much the loss of. It's too much loss of face and too much loss of hope. Well, it's like, I mean, I listen to LBC because I've, I've been working from home since March, and I've been listening, particularly in the morning, to one of your colleagues, uh, Mr. James O'Brien. Yes. And he's said it on many occasions, it's like, well, why would you, why would you vote for this? You know, and... People continually come on, you know, like people from Sunderland who might even work <laughs> for the likes of Nissan. Yeah. And they say, all right, well, uh, we're tired of the EU telling us what to do. Yes. It's, it's because they have been persuaded that the reason their lives are not as exciting and wonderful and uh, rich in all its meaning as they would like it to be is because of the European Union dragging them down. Yes, but don't you also think that uh, we've been lied to by, particularly when Boris Johnson was a columnist, he fed those lies, and media outlets like the BBC, who gave a ridiculous amount of coverage to uh, Nigel Farage, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, but LBC actually gave him a job. 
to yeah, and but, he was a most peace. Well, yes, that's really, true. But he, 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 he yes, that's true. Listen forward. to me. But we, but it was balanced by the very man that you've just described, who was on for three hours a day as opposed to one hour. That um, I'm sorry, but the, your explanation of balance is is not. Uh, a fair equivalent. It is. It's not balance. It is and balance. You are you aware of the brilliant Irish comedian Darrell O'Brien? Uh, I'm aware of him. Yeah, and he does a brilliant sketch, but he talks about balance and false equivalence. When it's like, right, here's astronomy, but in the interests of balance. We're going to have a, an astrologer on. Yeah, okay, but that, that's not a, an equivalent argument to what we're talking about. Yeah. Two, two different opinions about a political issue are not ab about um, uh, denying science, the settled science, which is what you're saying. It's perfectly reasonable to have somebody on uh, the right of an argument, the right wing of an argument, uh, on the same station as somebody who is on the left wing of an argument. In, in fact, I, uh, I would suggest that if it is the two people that you're talking about, James O'Brien versus uh, you-know-who, then um, James O'Brien got way more airtime than uh, Uncle Nige with his whinging and whining and moaning. Whinging and whining and moaning. Anyway, uh, Joe, I've got to go, but thanks a lot, mate. 0345 6060 973. Poll text. Oh, no, I've read that. Really? Those are the only two texts we got? We must have more than that. Work faster. <laughs> Here's uh, Orpington. Hello, Mike. Hello, Mike. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Cool, cool. Uh, just, just uh, uh, well, my opinion, obviously. Uh, if you was a Prime Minister, what would you do? What would I do? I would... I would have... Which I think Boris, I think he's doing a good job, oh to be fair. Which, Are you which, kidding me? Well, in what, what would you say? In what, what, what would you, what would you just, say? You've got no... You've got no, no wait, back up, back up, back up. <laughs> in what regard is Boris Johnson doing a good job? Well, I, I don't think anybody could do anything at the moment because we've got no cure for it. We've got literally uh, a country full of people... Uh, I don't know, it, it, it's, there's too many people in the country for a start, so you can't have enough services for everybody, everyone minds about that. There's too uh, many people? What do you mean? We've got, our population's massive. It's 65 million or something like that. Right, how many hospitals, schools, um, services that... Not enough. Is enough for... Yeah, not, exactly. not enough. Yes, well, that's not, a, right. that's not a function of the number of people. That's a function of successive governments not providing for those people. Right, OK. So what would you do if you was in charge? That's Ab my question. About what? About the whole situation. About the whole situation? Well, first of all, I would fire Boris Johnson and anybody right, okay. that he so has given a job to. He's fired, you're in charge. What yes. would you do? I would probably... Um, do what Germany and Sweden have done, a combination of the two. Allow people to live their lives while uh, I, I just buy German, well, during Germany's... During this pandemic, how can you live your life during this pandemic? How would you control the country with this pandemic going on? You can't just let everyone run wild, can you? Have you heard of Sweden? Uh, Sweden have probably got um, everything under control, so... Why don't we follow their footsteps and hopefully this would be a lot better than the way we're doing it. So how would you do it then? Do a Sweden. OK, so can we put this forward to Boris Johnson then? Yeah, OK, I'll get him on. The, get, get Boris Johnson on the phone straight away, if not sooner. He's not picking up. Serco picked up instead. Oh, my God. He's, he's routing his calls through Serco now. He's engaged. <laughs> yeah, I think it's gone a bit further than that. 0345 What would I do? What, you, you want me to come up with a plan for the country off the top of my head? 
just do exactly what a country that's getting a better result is doing. Germany, for instance. Stop thinking that you've got this, Boris. You don't have it. Obviously you don't. We have one of the worst results of any country on earth. You do not have things under control. You are not able. This is not you. Obviously. You're a good time Charlie who was voted in with one thing in mind. To have fun, do your act, you know, the <laughs> speak a bit of Latin, leave them all laughing and then uh, swan off to enjoy your money. What you were not expecting, I, I double bet with uh, cream on top, was that it would be an actual job rather than just having fun and making cash and setting yourself up for the future. Yeah, well, you know, stuff happens. But I think that uh, it would be uh, probably best for the nation if um, you admitted that you're not up to it and got somebody else to do it. That, that would be my first thought. This text says, New Zealand has got a cracking tourist bubble deal with Australia. New Zealand citizens can go to Australia but have to pay for a hotel to quarantine in for when they come back. Meanwhile, nobody from Australia is allowed into New Zealand. And negotiations were obviously very intensive. Well, I, didn't know, I didn't know about that. I mean, I knew that New Zealand uh, walled themselves off, just as Wales has done. <laughs> what a pretty place we live in. Wales has built a wall. I'm building a wall, okay? I'm building a wall. I'm building a wall, okay? I'm building a wall. They've walled themselves off from anybody that is in a COVID hotspot in England, which is everywhere. I mean, if the, if the hotspot rules start at medium, local COVID alert level, start at medium alert, not low alert, there is no such thing. <laughs> The COVID alert level does not go below medium. And so if that's the case, then um, everywhere is uh, just a couple of steps away from very, very high. Or, or as it's known in the trade, <coughs> 0345 6060 973, text 84850, email nick a at lbc.co.uk. And if you're on Twitter, it's at LBC. Did I do a break? Did I do the break? Sorry. Did I do the break? Say again. Did I do uh, the break? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. What, <laughs> Sorry. what does that mean? Did I? Oh, oh, yes. Sorry, I thought you said we need to go to the break. No, yes, we no. do. Well, we we do. do. We do need to go to the break. Okay, so that's cleared. Texts. Nick, Dido Harding's husband is the government's anti-corruption czar. They really are trolling us. <laughs> Yeah, he's our uh, anti-corruption uh, uh, wizard. Mm. <laughs> How's that whole anti-corruption thing going, by the way? Oh, fabulous. This is the most corrupt country in the world. We don't think of ourselves like that, but it actually is. For the amount of money that sluices through the city of London that is being washed clean on behalf of the international criminal super-rich, no other country does more than we do. We are the most corrupt country in the world. It's staggering, really, but it's true. And the, the, all of the financial uh, services racket is uh, based around doing just that. The accountants and the lawyers and the, particularly the banks, of course, the estate agents, all of that. Got a boatload of dodgy money, want to wash it clean? London! That's where you want to come, and the whole world does just that. Shocking. That's what we do for a living. Uh, P tweets, according to the Google Maps COVID filter, is there such a thing? I had no idea. Google Maps COVID filter, apparently there is, uh, there are no cases on the Isle of Man. So we can go there and close the border, says P. Yeah, let's go and live on the Isle of Man. That'll be interesting. Boring! I think I'd rather die. No offence. <laughs> Stockton on Tees. Hello, Brian. Yes, hello, Nick. Brian. Well, you're giving Boris a lot of flack again tonight, the way he's handling things. I know. Isn't it uh, so mean of me? He's he, he doing so well and all. 
And what's the alternative, Nick? Oh, God. And anything else would be better. Is, is Sooty or Sweep available? Kia Starmer's the alternative, isn't he? Sir Kia Starmer. No, of, 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 co of course he isn't the alternative. An alternative would be another Conservative. They having right. free reign right. for the next few years. Right. Well, we're, we're saying Keir Starmer was in charge. He wants to lock down the whole country. Yeah. What do well, you think about that, Nick? B Boris is going to do precisely that. No, but, he, he but he he's, come he's just going to do it locally. No, but it, enough local equals national. You want the complete opposite to what Keir Starmer said, don't you? Uh, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Call him. Come well, on, yeah. here's your chance. Keir Starmer isn't running the country, nor will he be for uh, the uh, f foreseeable future. But you're giving Boris Johnson loads of flack, fair enough. Yes. Give Keir Starmer a bit of flack over this. Right, well, I don't think, I think he's way out. Yes. I think he's, right. he, I think he's probably suggesting it in order you know, to uh, put clear blue water between him and you know, uh, so Boris Johnson and to uh, uh, guy uh, Johnson into... Um, into saying, no, I'm not going to lock down uh, the nation, and, and then uh, Keir Starmer will say, well, aha, so you don't really care about people's lives. I agree with I've you. Been watching, I've been watching Prime Minister's questions, right, Keir oh. Starmer, God. and just watching him, right? Mm -hmm. And, oh, you know, he, he looks like he's saying things through gritted teeth. He, he, he's ne very nasally, right. never smiles. He, look, he looks like he has a forced smile. I've worked him out, you know, I know what's the matter with him, Nick. <laughs> He's got constipation. <laughs> really? Right. Constipated get, Kia. Right. Get some, constipated get some Kia. prunes over to Kia Aura's but, place yes, immediately. But yes, yes, but he's had it for that long, this. Prunes won't do the job. You know what he needs? Dino rod. <laughs> it's that entrenched in him. The, the, come on. You know... We're in trouble at the moment. Yeah, but your, yes. your basic assertion is incorrect. The the alternative to Boris Johnson is not Keir Starmer. The alternative to Boris Johnson is... Would you oh, say, I, I don't know. Let's get to Theresa May back. Oh, no, thanks. <laughs> we're, just, we're just solving the problem what she caused, Nick. No, we've, that's I mean, completely untrue. I well, mean, I don't know which could, problem you're talking about, but if you're pr talking about a problem with the EU, then that would be David Cameron's fault. And we're still not missing you, Dave, but we know where to find you if we do. You'll be in the shed where they keep the tools. I think this you know, is you know, nonsense. As you know, Nick, I'm a big Brexit here, and I'm not actually happy. I think it's only 50-50 what Boris Johnson has done today. If he really meant it, he should have come out and said, no deal, that is it, no more talks. Mm. But he's left the jar, door ajar a bit, which I don't agree with. He had his big chance. Macron's been a fool. It was big, his big chance to make the excuse, oh, no deal. Right. Right? He's been a fool and in that he didn't give us everything we wanted. We, we screamed like a baby and him. threw ourselves he, to the floor of the supermarket because mummy he, wouldn't buy us a chocolate-covered sugar bomb. Hang on. You're calling Boris Johnson, right? This leader, Macron, is the worst leader in the world. No, he's, impossible. He's, he's foolish. He, right? He's the second the at, bloke, at best. Second bloke, worst. Right. The bloke, right, needs slapping on the face with a wet kipper. He's that much of a fool, right? You know, he knows that he, he wants the same things now as when we were in the EU with fish and waters. Impossible. Oh, God, you There's people and your fish. Right? Do you have no. any idea what kind of fish that we fish, that we pull no, out of the sea? Back, Nick. I've heard you say it hundred times. Uh, well, Matt, then, what, why do why you keep going on about it, then? Well why, well, why do they want it so much, then, if it's not worth anything? It's, making, it's not it that just, it's it's not that it's not worth anything. I mean, it's, it's, it's worth a relatively small amount of uh, our economy and theirs too. But it's a sticking right. point because I'll tell you what, and and it's just madness for us to be uh, yelling about fish, for us to be digging our heels in about that because it's got nothing to do with fish. It's about ruling the waves. We've got this idea that the map's still pink and our our sailing force can destroy the world. It's just such nonsense. It's flag-waving silliness, the thing about the Barnier fish. If Barnier comes here Monday, if Barnier comes here Monday, right, we, you know, we've said don't bother if you don't, you haven't got to change your view, uh, thing on it, right? Yeah, unless, you'll give us, Monday, unless you give us everything right? we want, we'll scream and scream here, and scream to us sick. Well, if he comes here Monday, well, I'll tell you what will happen, shall I? He will... Do the dirty on Macron. Who to will? To get things moving. Who will? Barnier will. He will finally, and, and Merkel, 
they, they, they'll have told Mac- Macron now, it hasn't worked what you've done, saying that we'll have no deal if you don't do dollar yeah. fish in that. Uh, and the reason that, and, it, and that, that, that the their negotiating couple, positions yeah. haven't worked is because our lot aren't really interested in negotiating. What they're they're happen- interested in pretending to negotiate, no way. But, but having a sticking point about the blooming fish that we pull out of our waters that we don't even want to eat, that we sell to Europe, well, that's Look. just mad. They're going to sell. They're going to sell Macron out down the next week or the week after. They can't keep that position about the waters, right? And the thing is, Merkel has to have a cars and all that, bill, worth billions and billions, sold this country, mm. Treasure Island. What they're going to do? They're going to want that rather than fish, aren't they? Come on! It would make more sense, which, which is which highlights how silly this fish thing is. I mean, th- yeah, well, all of the fish not- that we all of the fish that we pull out of our waters, we don't eat because, as I've said many, many times before, it's not to our taste. We prefer fish that doesn't actually taste of anything, which comes out of Iceland's waters or Norway, way up north. And so the the, the mackerel that we uh, have here, we sell it to France and Germany places in Europe. That's where they like it. Where else are we going to sell it? We're going to sell it to New Zealand. <laughs> it's, it's on the other side of the planet. This fish thing is a uh, smokescreen. It's got nothing to do with fish. The government doesn't really care about the fishing industry. Like I've said so many times before, Harrods the shop makes more money than the entire fishing industry in this country. And they employ more people. Anyway, Brian, uh, it's been a delight, as always. And um, But I do have to go because, you know, time waits for no one. You're better informed than I am. I don't know anything. Uh, this anonymous text says, You do realise Boris wanted to go down the Sweden route until you all screeched that it wasn't acceptable for your made-up reasons. I did no such thing. First of all, I didn't screech, and second of all, I didn't say that it wasn't acceptable. I uh, may have ridiculed him for saying that he, we should take it on the chin, just before he personally took it on the chin, and then he had a change of heart. You know, not that he uh, approached it in a selfish way or anything. Anyway, it continues, the fact if you had command of the country, you'd do a cross between Sweden and Germany makes no sense whatsoever. Well, if you thought about it for 10 seconds, instead of rushing to spew your bile all over this show, you'd realise that it makes perfect sense. What has Sweden done? They've allowed their people to continue their lives and take the precautions that they personally think are necessary. Other than that, they haven't uh, screwed up the country any. People have just continued to uh, lead their uh, hot Swedish lives. And in Germany, they've been all over uh, test and tracing. They, they did it straight away. They invented a uh, thing out of nothing in about 10 seconds flat that worked perfectly. And they've been all over it. So if you could do a combination between allowing people to run their lives and having an utterly competent and uh, totally inclusive test and trace system, then I think that that would be the perfect of all, the, the most perfect of all worlds. It, it, rather than makes no sense whatsoever, it's the only thing that does make sense, you Egypt, and I and I mean Egypt in the most uh, helpful and um, positive way. So yeah, Germany managed to do it straight away. They thought, um, let's make it so that the local um, authorities run it because they know their area. But in this country, uh, the uh, the n- national government is loath to give out any control to um, anybody but themselves, with the result that we see before us. Not only could they not get a test and trace system, you can't even say it. Contract taste, contact tasting, t- testing, tracing. Forgive me. Contract, contract, contact tracing. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Let's have um, Maidstone, Stephen. Hi, hi Nick. How are you doing? Good, thanks. 
Yeah, um, I think that we need to look at the world and try and understand what's been going on. And the fundamentals of what's been going on is that the centre of global power has been moving uh, to the West. It, uh, obviously, it's uh, many, many years ago it was in London, but now it's uh, moved over to New York. And I think that it continues to move to the West. So if we are looking at our, our trade issues and uh, international trade relations, we should be looking at places like Singapore and Hong Kong uh, as the basis of uh, what's going to happen next. Well, China, surely. That's, well, China, uh, that's where the money is. Well, China is certainly where the money is, and Hong Kong is, has been uh, their main access to global financial markets in order to get the capital that they required to build their to build their economy. And we could look at Singapore as well. Singapore is a slightly different example because it's an independent um, island nation, yeah. and it, it trades. And I think that well, it's just a port. It's basically a tax-free port. I mean, it's not really a country at all. It, it is a country. Um, it is a tax-free port as well. But uh, surely the fact that they are they're very prosperous and in, in, in living like this, uh, we should be looking at that as our example. Well, when you say they're prosperous, I mean it, it has one of the worst distributions of wealth of uh, any place on earth. There's a, 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 a few enormously wealthy people which pulls up the average earnings, and uh, and the rest of them are dirt poor and they ain't got nothing. I don't. I don't, wanna, I don't want to live in a place like Singapore. Who would? Well, I lived in Singapore for a little while. Yeah, and I, and, bet, I uh, bet you were on a, a whopping great salary. Uh, no, I wasn't at the time. I was in training. All right, but well, I bet you were doing comfortably well. Uh, yeah, I, I was doing okay. Right. Um, so, yeah, but my point with regards to Singapore is there's a nation and a trade, and it is, it is doing, it's very prosperous because of that. But what, it, what, what is your point, though, about Singapore? That we should be like Singapore? I think that we should look at uh, Hong Kong, for example, and Singapore as examples of what we can do. You're, you're looking at the... Uh, that's you're, that's you're a nonsense argument. How can you compare a country that is as complicated and, uh, uh, and uh, diverse as we are to two places that pretty much do one thing for a living? Uh, they, they do an awful lot more than one thing. I mean, there's a lot Not of research really. happening. Singapore is a tax-free port and yeah. Hong Kong is a financial centre. What else yeah. do they do? Uh, Singapore is a financial centre as well. Okay, all well, right. They're both financial centres. That, that's like comparing. Uh, you, you, if you could compare the city of London and Singapore, then yes, that's a, that, that's a good comparison. But not this country in Singapore. Uh, I think that you're you're focusing in on on the fish. Is, is uh, the fish uh, issue is is uh, fish? Getting What's distracted. fish got to do with it? Got to do? Got to do with it? Well, you seem to be talking about it quite a bit. But not with you. <laughs> you were the one that brought fish into this. I'm not talking about fish in, as uh, regards to Singapore. What's no, fish got to do with it? Well, I thought that's where the conversation left off before you went into your. Well, the conversation with the previous guy was about fish, but not with you. You're you're yep. banging on about how we should be like Singapore. How on earth can we be like Singapore? Well, the we... city of London can be like Singapore, but not the country of Great Britain. Well, I was talking about the pivot, uh, the pivot to the west. So yeah, but you keep uh, going on about the west, but it's not the west. It's the east, the, which is the new centre of power. Not the. I guess if you keep going west, you eventually end up to where you would be if you'd gone east. But that, that makes no sense. So, so the concentration of power is going west to New York, and what's yeah. after New York? Chicago. Um, probably Sydney. Sydney is not west of New York, but uh, I'm, I'm going to buy you a, an atlas. Atlas for Stephen and Maidstone. Thanks a lot, mate. 0345 6060973. Uh, did any of that make sense? No. Pamela tweets, Nick, have a look at the continent of Africa. I most certainly will do nothing of the sort, Pamela. She says they have the lowest deaths of any other continent. What are they doing that Johnson and his cohorts seem unable to? I don't know anything about that. I mean, the first couple of things, a uh, couple of three things that occur to me about Africa is people there get a lot of uh, sun, and sun is a thing that um, the virus doesn't like, apparently. Uh, also, not too fat, which is another thing that uh, the virus doesn't like, thin people. Other than that, I've got no idea. Maybe they just count the numbers wrong or differently than we do. Uh, D in Lanc but the people in the third world are going to be um, way more um, impacted than we are in the first world. I mean, our lifestyles will be uh, crimped somewhat, but um, millions and millions of us won't starve to death. 
which is what um, the third world is looking at. D in Lancaster texts, uh, talk about a good time to hide bad news. Dominic Cummings getting away with it again, now getting away with not paying rates on his second home in Durham, and we're supposed to trust the government. Well, I hadn't read that. Dominic Cummings doesn't pay rates on his second home in Durham? What? Oh, my God. Um, and maybe he forgot. Maybe he's, uh, he, he's such an enormous genius, a mega brain, that uh, his, uh, his mind is so full of complicated information that um, uh, stuff like uh, uh, paying rates on his second home, his, his mind just doesn't have the space for it. I mean, doesn't he look like a genius? Peter Sext's uh, message for uh, Nick Abbott, the glow in a BT trim phone was from a radioactive element. Google disposal of BT trim phones. Oh, homework? You're giving me homework? <sighs> but, sir, it's the weekend. Google disposal of BT trim phones. I most certainly will not. Okay, here comes this information. What is this information? That's the Dominic Cummings information. Dominic Cummings and his family are liable to pay council tax for properties on their Durham farm, but it will not be backdated. Dominic Cummings and his family are liable to pay, to pay council tax for properties on their Durham farm, but it will not be backdated. It means that years of unpaid taxes on two homes will be written off. Is that true? Yes, it's in the mirror. Well, the t <laughs> that doesn't necessarily... <laughs> it is, uh, it uh, is confirmed. OK, yes. then. Huh. I've said this before. They're, they're just trolling us now, aren't they? They must wake up in the morning and think, God, what can we do to them today? Because there doesn't seem to be any limits to the things that they can uh, say and do. Let's poke them with a stick for a while and see if they react. They're like bullies in the playground. They, they've got your hand and they're hitting you with your own hand, saying, why are you hitting yourself? OK, here's the full story. Boris Johnson's most senior advisor and his family will not be made to pay up to £50,000 of council tax for two homes built on their farm without planning permission. Oh, my God. Dominic Cummings and his sister's home on North Lodge near Durham were subjected to a planning investigation in June after a series of complaints were made by the public. Cummings built his cottage with his father in 2002. The investigation found the family owned between, oh, between 30 and 50,000 pounds of council tax on the two properties. But the amounts have been waived due to the amount of time passed, officials from Durham County Council said. I bet they wake up laughing. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any limits to what they can get away with. As with everything else, it's the government's guided by the principle of what would Donald Trump do? Donald Trump would tell you that he is picking your pocket while he is picking your pocket. And his fans would say, no, he's not picking my pocket. I am stunned. <laughs> I mean, really, people? Are you beginning to feel like you've been had yet? Just curious. Chris texts, you are completely right about government jobs, but it happens all over government. Ministry of Defence, Police and NHS are the worst offenders who all get massive contracts with their mates' companies who then employ them when they retire or get voted out. That's why taxpayers are constantly being ripped off. Well done for highlighting it. While I take no uh, credit for it, it's uh, journalists at the Financial Times and the Mail and, uh, and the, the Mirror and here, there and everywhere, baby. They're writing the stories, uh, but to people uh, get bored easily. Which is <laughs> precisely uh, the, the plan, I, I think. They keep, the government keeps throwing distraction bombs. You know, if we hadn't got this COVID thing, they'd be doing what uh, Donald Trump had done before the COVID thing. They just start throwing distraction bombs out the window. 
And so we're all, uh, it's like a, a, it's like a dog spots a squirrel. <laughs> And uh, it's to stop paying attention to whatever it was beforehand and starts uh, running after a squirrel. That's what we're like. Manchester, hello, Louise. Oh, hi there, Nick. Hello um, there, I agree, Louise. I agree, I agree with a lot of what you said tonight, and this has been going on for centuries. Centuries. Yeah. They think they're entitled to use this country as their own playground. Yeah. And they think they're entitled to... Um, Give, give their friends uh, promotions when they do what they ask them to do mm. for their own interests only. Yes. But, and the people should have far, far more power to get rid of them and stop them, as, as he says, spuffing money up the wall. Well, the people are too easily distracted. They won't concentrate on anything for 10 minutes. Um, and, um, they, and they just miss the point all the time. They keep uh, electing a government that has proven itself to be acting outside their interests, and they and they keep doing it over mm. and over again. It's our fault. Mm. Well, it's not mine, but, you know, <laughs> and not yours, probably, you know. But uh, we don't have any more there are that have sort of got the heads screwed on correctly. But, um, yeah, I'm and it's, sure... And it's not, by the way, just to um, interrupt you for one moment, it's, they're, mm -hmm. not, they're not treating it like it, this is their playground. They're treating it like this is their bank, and the... the and we left the doors open, and they're just going in and helping themselves. Yeah, they're shafting us at every turn. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it quite like that. But. <laughs> well, okay. well, what do you think? Well, well how, I mean, it's got to be strongly said, hasn't yeah, it? Well, I, I don't, think, I don't think that's allowed anymore, particularly if you're doing it uh, outside of your bubble. I wish they, I wish they, the other, the other, um, the other explanation of the word, yeah, I understand now. Um, yeah, and before I go, uh, Brian, for God's sake, herring and mackerel we do not eat in this country. No. They sell it, and it's probably one of them that's benefiting from it. <laughs> one, of the, one of the cronies. Because we don't benefit very much from it, so... It is Well, we benefit monetarily by selling yeah. it to Europe, but it is ironic that the, the fishing industry, which people are f freshly interested in and curious about and uh, passionate about, and mm -hmm. that is only a recent phenomenon that anyone could care less about the blooming fishing industry. I mean, what <laughs> have the Conservative Party done for the fishing industry? Okay. Up, up to this point. I mean, the communities that fish, uh, I, I bet the Conservative Party wouldn't be able to locate them on a map. It, it, no. here's, a, here's a clue. It's by the coast. <laughs> <laughs> and the other guy, I've actually been to Singapore three times. Oh, yeah. And uh, what do you think Dyson's doing over there? You know, like you say, it's a fun <laughs> I'm sure he, that, he went there for the weather. Yeah, I'm probably sure had, he had nothing. To to, bar all day. Yeah, had nothing to do with the saving taxes. That's fake news. Yeah, it was the weather yeah. he went there for. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. And so yeah, I, I'm on top of it, but obviously uh, can't do anything because we haven't got the money and the power. Well, we're you know, we're to, stuck uh, with the present administration for uh, what is it? The next uh, four years because four years, um, uh, because the because Brexit. Yeah, yeah. I, I cannot abide. I have to switch the radio off, actually. Um, if a certain people come on, I can't speak. I can't bear to hear their voices assaulting my ears, so I'll just switch the radio off and then listen again to either James O'Brien or, um, you know, somebody explaining to me after they've spoken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't bear it. <laughs> you've, you've drawn the line. You can't stand it anymore. I get it. It hurts my ears and yeah. my brain. Right. Well, um, then you want to um, insulate yourself from it. Uh, okay. I'll take your advice for that one. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Louise. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. This anonymous text says, "Fishing waters. What happens if Scotland decides to go for independence? No one's thinking about that outcome." Well, I've thought about it. Yeah, if, uh, huh. Because in Scottish waters, they do catch stuff that we actually like to uh, eat. How is it ours, by the way? I mean, the, the fish don't stay in one place. The fish don't have passports. They're not British. They uh, swim from here, there and everywhere, baby. We just um, launch a surprise attack when they come anywhere near us. And then... Uh, 
and then we sniff the catch, decide that that's a bit too fishy for us, and so we'll sell it nearby. Where's nearby? Europe. Oh, but, you know, they need us more than uh, we need them. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Sydenham. Hello, Janet. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I think I might have lost the plot here then. I've been listening. I just, I came in on the point of um, Fakir Starmer, mm. you know, and um, I think he's doing, I, I wasn't keen on him in the beginning, but um, I think he's doing a fairly good job. Do you? Yeah. I'm underwhelmed. Well, over, well, would he be overwhelmed, maybe, in terms of what he's got to take on? Which is, then it brings on as a London resident as well. Tadeek Khan has taken a hell of a lot of flack that I don't think he should have to do as well. Uh, yes, I suppose so. Uh, but, okay, what, outline the, the benefits to London of Sadiq Khan. Well, I think he's, he's, well, he's fighting back against, um, dear old, um, Bojo. Um, I'm hoping, I'm just about to come up to, um, 60. 60? Wow, mm. you made yeah. it! <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> Not quite. Um, but, you know, like, I just, oh, I don't know. See, I've never rang before, so help me out here then, and what I'm going to... I, I just think that anything has to be a better alternative to what we've got at the moment. Yeah. You know. I mean, is Coco um, the Clown available? <laughs> oh, well, that <laughs> Anybody. would be. Well, I, I've got a cat here now lying at the bottom of the bed. I yes. think she might even have a better idea She's, about what we're... She is hired. Can she start on Monday? <laughs> nah, she wouldn't want to do it. I mean, no. it'd be too much, you know? No, the cat would look at it and go... Exactly. No, and then go yeah. s go go into the corner and stare at the wall for three hours. Yeah, well, and it's like, well, where's my food? Yeah, you know, you haven't fed me for the last fifteen minutes. Mm. I do think, though. I mean, <laughs> that, I think that actually sounds more like our premier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where's <laughs> yeah, my food? You I haven't fed me it. in the last twenty minutes. That does actually sound exactly <laughs> like him. Yeah. <laughs> where did we ever end up with him, though? I mean. Uh. It's, um, it's unbelievable. We were we were I fed a fantasy of sunny uplands and uh, the life is going to get better, and the people not just me. bought it. They, they they bought it because they didn't have any other hope in their lives, and they thought, "Well, let's 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 hope that he's not lying to us." Well, how'd that work out? <laughs> oh well, there you go, like fake news. Fake <laughs> news. I I hadn't actually got the significance of that until I watched the um, Sky um, drama programme, the Comey thing. Oh, yeah. I have to say, I wasn't that informed before it. But actually, that is where fake news came from. He invented... Well, he didn't invent it. He said that he invented the words <laughs> fake and news, and he put them together because, uh, you know, he's, he's a very uh, bright and stable genius. But yeah, well, it, yeah, right. He he says things, and it, he hears them for the first time, and then assumes that he made it up, like uh, you know, science or um, or anything. Oh well, really. just how how to rule the world, really, yeah. in a good and proper way. Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a good and proper way. Everything that I've done is a hundred percent proper. That's what I do. Is I do things proper. He lied. All right, thanks a lot, Janet. I would say he's incompetent, but I don't want to do that because that's not nice. And you're a nice person. Thanks a lot, Donnie. Probably the worst person who has ever existed. Thousands of protesters gathered in London today to demonstrate against the COVID lockdown rules. No! They said, as uh, Londoners begin life under new Tier 2 restrictions. Everybody know what that means? No. <laughs> if your life depended on it. If a fiver depended on it, do you know what tier two is? Yes. Is that a no? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. The anti-mask demonstrators who were flanked by police held placards that read, Burn your mask and this is now tyranny. The group's calling for an end to social distancing and face masks, as well as wanting to halt any coronavirus vaccines. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's brother Piers was there. He said... <laughs> 
He was fined 10 grand for his part in a previous rally. He stood with a megaphone, yelling at crowds who had gathered in Oxford Street earlier today. Oh, I've seen those people with megaphones on Oxford Street talking about Jesus. Protectors, uh, protectors, protesters chanted, take off your masks, wear the 99% and stick your poison vaccine up your very bad word beginning with A. Disgusting. Some carried placards blaming the virus on the new 5G network. <laughs> Are they still going on about that? I thought it was all George Soros' fault. Isn't it something to do with uh, Bill Gates? Affirmative. Yeah, something like that. He wants to um, squirt a microchip uh, into your brain. Turn away and cough. The protest comes on the day that London was placed in Tier 2 lockdown measures, whatever that means. I actually have full details. One moment, please. Here are the tiers explained, as in T-E-A-R-S. The same restrictions as Tier 1. Do you know what Tier 1 is? Exactly. <laughs> tier 1. Medium risk. There is no low risk. There's no such thing as low risk. It starts at medium risk. It goes medium, high, and... <coughs> tier 1, medium risk. Current social distancing measures, the rule of six, and the curfew of 10 p.m. on pubs. D uh, does that make any sense? I mean, does anybody think that that makes any sense at all? I mean, what's the difference between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock? Or 10 o'clock, 11, or 1 o'clock? Apart from people don't get chucked out on the street at the same time. Anyway, I, I, I suppose they know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, tier 1, medium risk. Current social distancing measures and the rule of six and the curfew of 10pm on pubs. Tier 2, high risk. That's what London is in the moment. The same restrictions as Tier 1. You remember Tier 1, don't you? Uh, plus a ban on households mixing indoors and overnight stays. And multiple, multiple households can mix outdoors, including pub gardens, uh, but to a maximum of six people. Why? What difference does it make how many people you meet if they're, if you're, I mean, well, outdoors? I mean, you could go to a park with a thousand people, it wouldn't make any difference, would it? I mean, you're not going to snog them. So all of these people who were uh, marching in uh, London today, I expect that they were breaking Tier 2 rules. So London now in Tier 2, uh, London has a ban now from me meeting people outside their household indoors. From outside their household, indoors. And a maximum of six people from outside their household, outdoors. <laughs> oh. It's so complicated. Meanwhile, in Sweden... <laughs> demonstrators took a detour to Rathbone Square to stand outside Facebook's London headquarters. The Mail says it's not clear whether they were for or against the social media giant which may have been blamed for spreading pandemic misinformation. Yeah. You can get that right. What do I know about it? All I know is what's on the internet. Yeah, for what it's worth, I'm against the moon-faced creep who runs Facebook. I don't spend more than about 30 seconds a week on Facebook, and I recommend that you don't spend any more than that either. Go do anything else would be better. Do what a cat does, just to sit in the corner of the room and stare at the wall would be better than spending any time on Facebook. Many of those uh, gathered to carry signs reading, My Body, My Choice, which is a slogan borrowed from the pro-choice movement. One of the organisers told a breakaway group at da outside Downing Street, Man Flu has closed our country and crushed our economy. <laughs> You're not helping yourselves, really. Jeremy Corbyn's brother Piers Corbyn had been present during a smaller protest against the new measures in Soho last night, which saw some people led away in handcuffs, which is normal for Soho. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much any night of the week. Someone's going to get led away in handcuffs. And, uh, like I said, all of this is verboten because London is now under Tier 2, which is amber or high alert or panic now to save time later. One of those. And uh, regulations in the second level of lockdown mean that people must not socialise with anybody outside of their household, outside or inside, or in a support bubble or in any indoor setting, or socialise with a group of more than six outside, including in a garden or a street. Everybody get that? No. But on the other hand, we are talking about people's lives here that are just being hosed away like the dirt off a car. 
200,000 people in the hostility business might lose their jobs this weekend because the restaurants and the bars and the pubs and everywhere else that people go out to be with other people can't do no business no more. And that means that they won't have the life that they imagined for themselves, that they'd worked for, saved for, taken risks for, all of that gone. As well as a roof over their heads in a lot of cases, I would imagine. You know, it's okay for millionaire politicians guaranteed a solid gold pension and the ability to earn millions more by not doing anything after they retire from politics. You know, being consultants or advisors or any of the non-jobs that don't actually involve doing anything other than lending their name to some business that they've probably done favours for while in office. None of this is going to affect them at all. In fact, many of them will just get richer because of the turmoil. And the government's got another four years to do anything they want without consequence. But for the little people, not leprechauns, we've had our whole world pulled out from under us like a rug. People are staring at destitution. And the government thinks that people can just bounce back by retraining as, I don't know, stock takers. You know that poster of the ballerina with a headline, Fatima's next job could be in cyber, she just doesn't know it yet, is one of the most depressing ads I've ever seen. If that's the new genius media team that Dominic Cummings has put together, if that's what they're capable of, I know this sounds controversial, but it, he, it might be that he isn't actually a genius. A girl who trained her, tra trained her whole life to dance, has to retrain to sit at a desk and tap numbers into a computer. If that's the brave new world that's being ushered in, you can stick it where those protesters told the government to stick their vaccine. Hello, Adam. Well, that's uh, happy, Nick. Good evening. Um, I am just, uh, my brain is exploded, uh, quite frankly, with the amount of rules that uh, this government and the London mayor I don't know whether I'm coming or going or whether I should dissect myself into different pieces, different people at different time. And let me tell you this for nothing, Nick. There's a fantastic bagel shop and kebab in Temple Fortune where I used to meet my brethren and have a chill-out session. Now it's more like a rugby scrum. You can't get the kebab. The people outside are absolutely bonkers. I'm having to, res to go into a, a field which is just down the road next to the North Circle where there's a few horses running around, as long as you don't get your feet in the manure, is that a safe place for meeting? It's not considered a garden. That's what right, I okay. want to know, I've got, I absolutely no idea what you're talking about. So, so, something about uh, horses. <coughs> He's in a field having a, uh, a, a bagel. Right. Well, it makes as much sense as anything else is happening right now. Meanwhile, in Sweden, they're just carrying on with their lives, you know, like normal people. You can remember normal, don't you? No. Tony Kelly tweets, President Trump is not the worst person in history. He's just another narcissistic sociopath. No, he's not another narcissistic sociopath. He's the narcissistic sociopath. A president! <laughs> can you believe it? I bet money that he'll still be president this time next year. I bet that he loses the election, but manages to cling on. Like a Klingon. Who would bet otherwise? 0345 But like I said before the news, there is, some, uh, there is some good that's come out of all this. Boris Johnson's got himself a new photographer. And we're paying for it. There you are, you see. Silver linings. I'll come to that in a minute. I'll, I'll also... Um, uh, uh, declare war on the Royal Navy. Or, more accurately, the Ministry of Defence. Have you heard? Oh, the stuff that's happening. It's just, uh, it is mind-boggling. Stephen Upminster texts, My wife and I had our flu jabs this morning. Really? Just a little pinprick. <laughs> That'll keep you going for the show. Uh, he said, we had to queue in the car park. We had to keep two metres apart, log in at reception, take the right coloured ticket and get your shot. We did it all in the correct order, so, <laughs> so I'm hoping we'll get extra points. If you get it in order, you get extra points. Oh, I thought there was more to that. You get extra points if you get it in order. Do you want to hear the whole thing? Oh, OK, then. And it was 30 or 35 questions. The first questions are very easy. The last questions are much more difficult. 
uh, like a memory question. It's uh, like you'll go person, woman, man, camera, TV. So they say, could you repeat that? So I said, yeah. So it's woman, man, camera, TV. Okay, that's very good. If you get it in order, you get extra points. Okay, now he's asking you other questions. And then 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes later, they say, remember the first question? Not the first, but the 10th question. Give us that again. Can you do that again? And you go, woman, man, person, camera, TV. If you get it in order, you get extra points. They said nobody gets it in order. It's actually not that easy, but for me it was easy. <laughs> He's so thrilled with himself for getting uh, something that a child of for five would be able to answer. Nobody gets it in order, but for him it was easy. If you get it in order, you get extra points. Extra points for getting it in order. Uh, you, you might even get a lollipop, Donnie. 0345-6060-973. How did a country get taken over by a guy with the mental ability of a small soap dish? I'd love to know what the answer to that is. I mean, it, it wasn't difficult. It was easy. If you told us a few years ago that America was in danger of becoming a fascist dictatorship because some a comedy bloke off the telly had taken the country over, you'd have got laughed out of the house. But it's actually happening right now. And by the way, did you um, see the uh, data dump? Carol, um, Carol, wala, 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 uh, out of The Guardian, who's been all over this story like white on rice, uh, come, come to find out that um, the thing that I've been saying forever is actually true. I can't believe it. That the people who bought us Donald Trump also bought us Brexit. The very same people. Like a couple of three billionaires. That's it. Gee, what a what a. I mean, people um, uh, on the right talk about uh, coups and um, conspiracies, and there, there, there is a conspiracy. It's happening right in front of your face. It's just that you bought into it, so you can't see it. You refuse to acknowledge it because that would mean losing face. That would mean admitting that you've been had. Are you beginning to feel that you've been had yet? Um. Anyway. Might get to that later. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Let's have Worcester, Dave. Uh, good evening, Nick. Uh, uh, regarding the demonstrations uh, today, yeah. Um, fundamentally, they're they're wrong. Um, well, they're well intentioned, and they're not. They're right not to to trust to trust the government or any of its agencies. Yeah. Well, they, they've are, proven are, themselves to be untrustworthy. Yeah, for regardless of the virus, and therein lies one of the major problems that we're facing, that for decades, all our lives, we've been told to uh, adversarial system, a man, every man for himself, to compete against each other in their venal, um, greedy, selfish, uh, elite racket game. <laughs> now, when we, <laughs> put it put, now, when we need to pull together collectively, yeah. perhaps, against a so-called common enemy, which no doubt it is, it's virtually impossible for this society to do it because of I the I disagree. The We've been doing particularly well, considering that all of our lives have been uh, changed right in front of our faces, and um, the well, future that we dreamt for ourselves is no longer available. I think we've done very well. Well, our future has been bought and sold decades ago to uh, our industries. But here, here, here in lies the facts. You, you say about Sweden, you're quite right. But it's no surprise, and I'm not advocating these societies, it's no surprise that the more authoritarian dictatorships, China, Thailand, Vietnam, they've eradicated the virus, right? Because well, they are we, a collective we, we, society. Don't, we don't really know because of the well, nature think, of those countries. We've got no idea what's happening in China other than what we hear from well, China. You, well, you could say the same about our, our, uh, our people that pump out the propaganda from the... Uh, the best propaganda unit in the world, the BBC. They've been oh, pumping out. Oh, do me a favour. The BB, the, the all-powerful <laughs> BBC. I mean, is that is that really who you're blaming for this? God, you, <laughs> you, you, for... you people are out of your minds. <laughs> the, the actual power in the media in this country is about three billionaires, all of whom don't live here. What are you talking about? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, our, one of our best writers, uh, George Orwell, he worked at the BBC. 
and room 101 was actually the room where he worked. Yeah, he and, it, and it, it was, com and it was completely unremarkable, room 101. No, he hated it. He hated it. He hated the BBC. He knew then it was run by a cabal of privately educated freaks. He got out. He okay, uh, you, plenty, plenty enough, uh, Dave. Go uh, shout in a box. Blow up a paper bag and um, put your thoughts in that. God, painful. The BBC. Yeah, that, that's the problem. Not uh, If only this country had, uh, you know, enough uh, right-wing media outlets, then we'd really be getting somewhere. Because at the moment, we've only got the Sun and the Sun on Sunday and the Express and the Sunday Express and the Times and the Sunday Times and the Sun... Uh, did I mention the Sun? <laughs> and the Telegraph, or the Sunday Telegraph, and every uh, paper that anybody reads is right-wing. And the Mail, of course, the most powerful of the lot all owned by offshore billionaires. And he's whining about the BBC. John in Rill. Hey, Rill, just up the road from Prestatin. Uh, he says, uh, no, Nick, anybody who doesn't believe in Brexit doesn't believe in Britain and maybe should move to a country they do believe in. Oh, God. If you don't agree with me, then leave the country. God, this, this has gone downhill really rapidly, hasn't it? Who are these people? I'll sum, I'll sum up their thought in a nutshell. <laughs> Anybody that doesn't believe in you should leave the country, John. You see, people like you, John, aren't remotely interested in what happens to the country, just as long as you get what you think you want. What you've been, um, what has been really easy, actually, to persuade you that you th to imagine that is good for you. It's actually the opposite of that. As you would know, all you have to do is look at what the pound is worth before uh, the uh, Brexit uh, referendum and now. And if that d doesn't mean anything to you, then uh, give me your address and I'll come over and take 20% of your stuff. The difference between you and me, John, is that I am actually interested in uh, what benefits the country. You aren't. You, you just want what you want and to hell with anybody else. But you've been persuaded by um, flag-waving uh, phonies that it is uh, that to disagree with you means that you are a traitor. Whereas the opposite is the truth. We've got a few idiots in our party. Yeah, a couple of three idiots. Anyway, around two hundred thousand people in central London could lose their jobs in the hostility industry this weekend as Tier Two sees a maximum squeeze on revenue and no support. Tier 2 has got to be the worst of all tiers. Because you don't get no money in Tier 2. You've got to shut down or close down and uh, trade under uh, terrible restrictions, but you don't get a bung from the government. Tier 3, if you've got to actually shut down and go home and uh, lock the door behind you, then you get some uh, uh, a, a financial fillip. But otherwise you get nothing. I w if I was um, the, uh, the mayor of uh, Manchester, I think I'd be yearning for Tier 3. I mean, that, that's where you might actually be able to pay the rent at the end of the week. Anyway, 200,000 people in central London could lose their jobs this weekend, says an industry spokesmodel. Um, and it was very, very quiet, apparently, in uh, London today, but less so this evening. Did you come through uh, central London this evening? Yes, I did. You yeah. did. And how was it? Uh, very busy, lots of police. Chocolate. It was busy with police. Yes. <laughs> right. I'm not sure that's actually good for trade. Revelers descended onto London's streets last night to enjoy what was described as their final night out before the capital is plunged into the tighter lockdown restrictions announced by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. You know the health secretary, Matt Hancock, don't you? Boo! Yes, that's him. From midnight last night, individuals from different households in London, Essex, York, and parts of Derbyshire were banned from mixing indoors, even in hospitality venues, with outdoor socially distanced mingling permitted for groups of up to six. What a ridiculous phrase. Outdoor socially distanced mingling. What on earth does that mean? Actually, a mingle from a distance. Get Bette Midler on the phone, and she'll sing it for us. 
So you can meet, you can meet somebody outdoors, but as outdoors is blooming freezing and wet, uh, that's pretty much out. It's out until June. And besides, how can you mingle at a distance? Mingling requires some sort of closeness. Other, otherwise, you'd be able to do it on the phone. Can you mingle on the phone? Negative. Of course not. So after uh, the uh, tier two ban, groups of friends have now got to meet outside. That's up to six, not seven, and definitely not eight. Six or less from different households will be required to meet in beer gardens or at restaurants outdoors if they want to have, uh, you know, what used to be called a social life and what we now call covidiacy. It used to be uh, called going out to have a nice time and now it's called killing granny. Kate Nichols, the chief executive of UK Hospitality, said the new restrictions are likely to see businesses in central London letting about 200,000 people go this weekend. She said the uh, pain of tier two is that you have no government support. Yeah, it's the stupidest of all tiers. It's a very bad tier. It says if you're going to level three, you're getting support if you're closed, so at least uh, you would have something to pay the staff. For businesses in this part of the capital, it would probably be better to be paid to be closed. Yeah, what a, what a place we're in. It would be better for people running restaurants to close their restaurant. They'd be better off. Well, the whole world's gone crazy. I mean, yeah, it's actually something to think about for the Mayor of Manchester, Andy Burnham, who's resisting the uh, Tier 3 lockdown. You only get the money when you're in Tier 3, honey when restaurants and bars have to close down. You've just got to limp along in tier two, where the numbers are cut, you can only meet friends for a meal if you eat outside, for crying out loud, you get no money. And this 10 o'clock closing thing, I mean, I've said this before, it's a, it's a death knell for restaurants, never mind about bars. I mean, they've, um, they, they just lose an hour. Restaurants lose an entire half an evening, because you normally want two sittings in a restaurant. You want the people that come at 7 and leave at 9, and you want the people that come at 9 and leave at 11. But if you've got to shut the place at 10, you only get one sitting. So that's, that, that's already half their potential um, um, take uh, before you've even started. And then you've got to take out half your tables, and um, people who are now um, are not living together, they can't go out and... I mean, I've already uh, cancelled a meal that I was going to go and have it. Uh, out. I was going to do my bit to uh, pr to save the economy. I'm a good boy, I am. But I've had to cancel that now. <sighs> on a positive note, they carried on filming Batman at St George's Hall in Liverpool. So if we survive the pandemic, we'll have something to watch. Yeah, on on um, video disc, because <laughs> you won't be able to go to a cinema. I, th I suppose cinemas are open, uh, but for how much longer? Some of those chains have closed because, uh, you know, what are you going to do? God, everything is just... It's like living in one of those disaster films. A, like a really, really boring and long one. <laughs> well, if it was TV, I'd be switching over to see what's on the other side. Who's playing Batman now? I mean, we don't know who's going to be the next James Bond. Um... If, if, if it's that bloke who was in um, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, then that's okay. Whatever his name is, that's fine. Because he looks like he could kill somebody. But no posh Etonian, please. We can't go back there again. You have to look like a thug now to be Robert Pattinson. What? Yeah. Oh, Batman. Yeah. Oh, please, please let him not be the new James <laughs> Bond. <laughs> no, it's Batman. Oh, Pats. B uh, really? He's that drip from those films. The silly films about wizards or whatever it is. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, what was that about? Twilight. Twilight. Ugh. He's Batman? Okay, sign me up for uh, not going. I can't wait not to see it. No, it better not be somebody like him playing the new James Bond. It has to be um, like a real thug. Has to be. They should get that bloke from Start Up. I keep saying this. Get Barbara Broccoli on the phone right now. Ask her if that's really her name. Glenn says, The trouble with the BBC is that it's full of Ramonas who can't accept the result of the biggest democratic result in history. Blah, blah, blah. Even after four years. Glenn, even after four years, you still are refusing to admit that you've been had. Where's the benefit? Point to it. 
a, a, a small handful of billionaires brought Trump and Brexit to the world at the same time. And it was easy. It was a piece of cake. I bet they wake up uh, laughing. Just still stunned that it was so easy. I mean, at what point are you going to admit that um, you've been had? Like, never, presumably. Always looking for those sunny uplands. Yeah, well... They'll, uh, they'll be here, you know, just as long as you can wait for the rest of your life. Martin tweets, as a Dutchman, I have been to Rill to see what the UK would look like a few years after it left the EU. Lots of boarded up shops, derelict homes and fat fish and chip outlets with shop owners moaning that business used to be better. Quite an eye opener. Yeah, I was kidding about um, Rill being a delight. I've been there too. Uh, in fact, I was there in the 1970s. I imagine it hasn't changed a jot. Uh, that's where the whole country is going. Uh, by which I mean, I don't mean actually going to real, but, you know. 0345. I, I wouldn't go past Prostatin. Just stay in Prostatin. It's a delight. Hackney. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Nick. Sarah. Right, I want to talk about these um, goody-goody-choo-choo's protesters. Right? Are they? Where are they getting their facts from? They're not considering anybody else the elderly, the vulnerable, the people who got a shield, people that have lost loved ones through the virus. Why ain't the police arresting them all? And for Corbyn's brother, who's causing half of this problem, hmm. should be banged up. <laughs> right? <laughs> and as Steve Allen would say, bang them all up. Really? Is, is Steve Allen yes, is really. um, he's a, a crime and punishment. Uh, one of those, is he? <laughs> Well, I totally agree with Steve Allen. Hanging's too good for him. We, <laughs> well, it would be yeah. it would be but, a pretty uh, disastrous place to be living if they Nick, banned protesting. But Nick, where is their common sense? They've been brainwashed by Corbyn and his lefty brother, right? Yeah, I, I don't think they really see eye to eye on anything. But go ahead. Right. Oh, well, whatever. I don't like the cool bins anyway, full stop. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but what I'm trying to... Yeah, but they're not thinking of anyone else, Nick. Well, who isn't thinking of themselves? Because I've got a shield and I don't want to be shielding for the rest of my life. Well, yeah, get used to it because I think if a vaccine... Well, no. Even if a vaccine is invented tomorrow, you probably won't get one for a year. Well, I've been told as soon as my doctors can get the vaccines, mm. right, I'll be first on the list because yeah. I'm under the vulnerable group. Well, I'm and sure I'm that's that right, Nick, but, but it, Nick, it still I'm might it still daughter. might not be for your for the rest of your life. Don't pin your hopes on a vaccine. But Nick, I haven't seen my daughter since February, right? Well, I haven't seen her either. <laughs> you ain't likely to, Nick. But Nick, what gives these to right? Right, <laughs> Nick, you crack me up. But listen, <laughs> on a serious note, yeah, uh, where are they saying that COVID don't exist? Right. What planet are these people on? That, well, yeah, so, some of them uh, do seem to be um, yeah, extraterrestrial, intellectually <laughs> speaking. Well, all hey, all that stuff about five G. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bit unhinged, Sarah. I'd rather have aliens than see ugly mugs on my TV stating facts that are ain't, ain't even true. Right, OK, I'll, um, I'll send some round. <laughs> Watch for them at your door. Thanks a lot, Sarah. All the best. 0345 6060 Josh texts, Tom Hardy is the new James Bond. Tom Hardy, that's the bloke in uh, Mad Max Fury Road, right? Sorry? Ma Mad Max Fury Road, that's Tom Hardy, right? Uh, yes. Have you seen Mad Max Fury Road? No. What? Not my thing. W what is your thing? Uh, I don't know, but it's not that. Well, what's your, what's your favourite <laughs> film? You'll, you'll say something like Ghost. <laughs> <sighs> I, I haven't really got a favourite film. What is that? How can you not have a favourite well, film? Well, I feel on the spot, there's a lot of people listening. Right, oh, okay then. Excuse me. I thought it was a pretty reasonable question. I mean, everybody's got a favourite film, don't they? Apparently that's uh, that's prying too much. Yeah, Tom Hardy. If you haven't seen um, Mad Max Fury Road, is it Fury Road or Thunder Road? No, Thunder Dome, Fury Road, Fury Road. Oh, 
It is amazing. I think it's a toss-up between that and uh, Terminator 2. Affirmative. As the best uh, action film of all time. I would uh, be hard-pressed to decide which to see again if I was sitting in front of the TV and I had to choose between one and the other. I don't know which one it would be. I'd have to buy another TV and play them both at the same time. Turn them up really loud. 0345 Yeah, Tom Hardy would be all right, but um, that bloke who was in Starred Up, because he, he just looks like a total thug. He would be good in it. Either or, just as long as it's not some blooming old Etonian. No offence. Lewis, I mean, James, in Lewis. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, basically, I've got a theory about um, Brexiteers and um, mask uh, or anti-maskers. Yeah. Now, the theory is that Brexit was sold on the premise that um, basically, that people don't like being told what to do. That vote leave said the EU are telling you what to do. You don't like being told what to do, do you? God. And they voted leave. Yeah. And I think I... those very same people mm -hmm. also are now being told you don't like wearing masks. You don't like being told to wear a mask. You don't like being told to social distance. You don't like like being told what to do. Okay, that, that's a very um, <laughs> complex and twisted, tortured thought you just came out with there. I'm not sure what point you're trying to make. Are you trying to make the point that the people that were uh, persuaded to vote to leave the European Union did so because they bought into that whole, oh, unelected bureaucrats dictate into us and we've got <coughs> no control and bent bananas and vacuum cleaners that don't suck very well and all that nonsense. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so like I said, the EU are telling us what to do. Yeah. We don't like being told what to do. And those very same people are now being told what to do, like wearing masks and social distancing, and they don't like to do that either. Right. Okay. There, there's a thought in there somewhere, uh, James. If you, you <laughs> just go and <laughs> contemplate it for a couple of hours and come back to me, all right? Full report on my desk first thing in the morning, please. Yeah, what's deeply comical, well, it's not comical, of course, because we're having to live through it, but what is um, uh, ironic is that um, this has all been brought to us by uh, Dr. Evil, Dominic Cummings, who is, guess what, an unelected bureaucrat. <coughs> the um, scourge of the unelected bureaucrats, Dominic Cummings, has persuaded people to vote to leave the European Union because of a hatred of unelected bureaucrats. We've got an unelected bureaucrat that's running this country. We have an unelected upper house who is overseeing our parliamentarians, who answer to an unelected head of state. I mean, if you just think about it for 10 seconds, people, you'll realise that you've been had. And then you have to go through the torturous process of admitting that, um, that you have been duped. I know it constitutes a loss of face, but the sooner you do it, the uh, the happier you'll be. Says, I'd rather have aliens than Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings. Yeah, well, Dominic Cummings mostly comes out at night. Mostly. He does look like, he does look like he would be uh, appearing in an old black and white German vampire film, doesn't he? I say we blast off and nuke the entire site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Paul in East London says, Why is it whenever there's a serious crime or murder, police can't get a witness? Now you only have to invite one extra person into your house and people can't wait to snitch. And Jack in Chingford says, Can you believe that leisure centres such as swimming pools are opened? So my neighbours can't come to my house, but I can jump in the same swimming pool with them. Ridiculous. What I find a bit surprising um, is that there, there hasn't been a major news story about people catching it in gyms. I mean, I did read one thing about, I think it was in Canada, some spin class, and there was uh, like 60 or 65 percent of the people that went to this one spin class uh, caught it. Of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that they caught it while they were spinning, but it seems likely. I mean, you're in there panting your face off. But um, 
yeah, I mean, people are c catching it in schools, yes, of course, and colleges. I mean, who could have uh, predicted that, apart from anybody that thought about it for 10 seconds? And people are catching it in uh, workplaces, you know, the place that you have to go back to, otherwise you're going to get fired, according to Boris Johnson. And now they're saying the opposite. In, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. And um, where else do you get it? Um, restaurants are way down the list. Uh, prisons are <laughs> practically the safest place you can possibly be. But gyms aren't even on the list, unless they come in that category of other. But you'd think that it was, uh, it'd be so, uh, you know, you'd want to get the news out there if people are actually catching it in gyms. I I'm surprised. Because, uh, you know, people pant in gyms, don't they? Grunt and groan, they do. Especially if they're trying to really impress people. Uh, Manchester. Hello, Tony. Hello? Tony. Yeah. Is that Nick? Is that Tony? Yes, it is. Wow. Now, how nice to speak to you again. I have spoken to you before. Oh, yeah. uh, I'd just like to reiterate, uh, what I think what the gentleman before was trying to say was not, not so much what Europe is telling us, but when we were given the vote, should we come in or should we stay in or go out of Europe? Mm. And uh, according to the figures, 48% said that and 52 Well, I don't believe that for a minute. I think huh? it was far higher people wanting to come out. But well, why, don't, why don't you believe it? Because every vote they have in the government, it's always 48-52. It does make sense. Anyway... Well, no, wait a minute, so you don't believe it because it's, it's too close? Uh, well, uh, I've heard it on so many o oh my other God. things. You, and you've it's read, on read it on the internet? No, no, I don't use the internet. No, right. So uh, what I'm going on to say is but that... Can we uh, just back up a second? Why, why don't you believe that it's 48 to 52? I mean, the boy just split down the middle. <laughs> it, it's whenever they have a vote on anything. Anything, so you, 48 you, you'll 52. Listen, you'll so listen. what are you suggesting? That the people who... <laughs> the people who... It fixed, but, but leave one. If, it was, <laughs> if you're saying that the that Ramona's fixed it, then wouldn't they have fixed it so that they won, not no, let, not lost no. by a small amount? What would be the point of that? But because it gives, uh, they can run this for years, you know, uh, uh, and milk it as much. Uh, Tony, it been, uh, Tony, think about what you're saying. You're saying that the, the, the vote was fixed by the people who lost. No, no. You uh, are. That's exactly what you're saying. No. What, what I'm saying is, listen, if everybody I know, and I know a lot oh of people... Oh, my God, they all think the same as you. No, no, not necessarily. But what they all say is they'll never vote again. Good. Because, <laughs> because of what happened. Now, There's a lot of people in this country who should not be allowed to vote or uh, I, reproduce, for that I, matter. I, I understand that. Uh, but the whole point about it is that people have lost all faith in anything the government and this is why they won't stay at home and they keep going out because uh, if something as important to that can be overturned which they very nearly did it oh please uh, no they didn't they didn't do anything of the sort what are you talking about they overturned the verdict the no, they, they very nearly changed the vote and we nearly stayed in Europe. In, what way, in what way did they do that? By fixing well, the vote to be 48 to 52? <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the, the genius um, uh, people uh, who uh, presumably live in hollowed out volcanoes, they're so, they're so good at um, their uh, charlatanism mm -hmm. that they changed the vote to only lose by a bit. Uh, uh, what would be the point of that? Nick, Nick let, let me just uh, refresh your memory. You had Jeremy Corbyn that said, we are going to stick by the vote that the people did. Yeah. We, and then in the next breath, he said, well, yeah, I think we ought to have another referendum, you know. I think we ought to have another think, go at it. Yes. Well, what would be wrong with that? But, but they didn't. I don't no. understand what you're saying. You're saying that the people, people fixed the vote to lose. What, what, what I'm saying is that this... Uh, 
people can't understand why the government are telling us you must not say, you mustn't mix with people, you must stop going out, you mustn't meet up in pubs, and they know it's futile because they're going to overturn it anyway. You know, who's, uh, who's like, going to uh, overturn what? Like Dominic Cummings, you know, uh, he can get away with oh, yeah. this other but lady. It's no surprise. She's, it's no surprise that it's one rule for them and one rule for us. I mean, that that doesn't shock you, does it? No, no. I'm just uh, I'm just making a point, and this is why people are totally ignoring every single. I don't think they to, are doing anything well, of the sort. Well, uh, you've seen all this celebration in Liverpool, uh, football matches going ahead, people going to raves, parties, uh, meeting up 200 at a wedding, you know. Um, yeah, but uh, that doesn't represent the majority of the people, that's just outliers. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, <laughs> how, how have you been acting, Tony? Um, uh, totally responsible. There you go, the... that's most people. But I'm, I'm at an age where... Uh, how old are you? 70. But I'm 70 years old. I'm, I'm uh, young. I, and you, I'm a, I'm you still young. have uh, all of your faculties. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> al almost. Uh, I've, I've got patents out anyway. Do you have any European patents? For what? Uh, I'm, I'm going to regret asking that. Go on. Well, I've got some for uh, some of the major companies, mainly in the building trade. Patents? So, for, for what? Uh, the protected uh, have an international patent on them. Yeah, so, but for what though? Building, I can't tell you because of course you of can if you've got a patent out in it. Of course you can. <laughs> well, I've got a, a patent out on ceiling fixings. Do you know? Do you know what a noggin is, Nick? Uh, yes, but we're not allowed to talk about that uh, before midnight. <laughs> Well, it's a keg of beer, but it's also a timber support in between ceiling joists that stop your plasterboards sagging. Right. And uh, I've got a patent on that, an international patent. Right, and, because uh, nobody's invented that before? Joists? No, no, no. They just uh, used to put a piece of timber in, but it takes ages to do. The one I uh, came up with is a metal straw. As you put your plasterboards on, you slip the noggin onto the edge of the board yeah. and then the other one slips in and but with two lugs and it stops it dropping down right, and, that, uh, and that, that sounds about the most disgusting thing i've ever heard in my life well, and, and, and d please don't do it with uh, anybody outside of your personal bubble always wear protection thanks a lot tony does any of that make sense no his small hands how has he been given permission to, bu to build another golf course? That's, that's what that area needs, another blooming golf course. Chris in Norwich says, by the way, Nick, you should drink Earl Grey tea. It's uplifting bergamot oil scent. It's good for health and feeling good. It's good for health and feeling good. A little milk can be lovely. Milk? Disgusting. No, it's a no from me. And Johnny says, uh, I agree with you about real. You've mentioned prostatin, but don't forget clandered no. It's lovely up there by the sea. Yeah, what about Abigaili? Don't forget Abigaili. Uh, Carl says, did you see Tom Hardy playing both the Cray twins in that film a few years ago? No, I did not. Blooming Kraken, he says. What an actor. And he played Charles Bronson. Cracking acting. <laughs> cracking. cracking acting. I'm not into Bond, but if he Bond, I might be interested, says Carl. Beginning to sound like Tarzan. If he Bond. Uh, let's have a call in um, East Yorkshire. Hello, Mike. Hi, Nick, yeah. Um, just talking about Trump and planning reminded me of something I wasn't going to talk about, but um, did you see Jenrick on Ma? Uh, no. Well, what it turns out is that um, in Robert Jenrick's constituency, there was a planning application and an application for government funds, which was approved by one of Jenrick's other ministers yeah. in the same department. Yeah, they, um, um, they, sh they shook each other's hand. One one washed the other's hand. Yeah. Absolutely. And then in the other constituency, Jenrick approved the planning application. <laughs> They're all in each other's pockets. <laughs> They're all in it together. <laughs> yeah. But what I was going to say is, do you remember a little story about Cummings going up to um, Barnard Castle? Of course. Yeah, Gollum went to Durham. Absolutely. Um, but now he's been let off a £30,000 council. Yeah, I think it's worse than that. 
It is worse than that, yes, but I'm sure you can enlighten the people better than oh, I can. Oh, all right then. <laughs> 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 Thanks for teeing me up, talking of golf. Thanks a lot, Mike. <laughs> 0345 6060 973. So did you see that piece about Boris Johnson's uh, totally above-board relationship with business colleague Jennifer Akuri? Just uh, changing the subject wildly, just for a moment. The one that uh, practiced the pole dancing with her very own pole. That Jennifer Akuri. Well, the mail had the story and it started like this. Grip onto something firm because you're not going to like it. This is how it started. So, Jennifer, is our Prime Minister a Y-fronts or boxers man? And already, I bet you're feeling queasy. A little bit bilious. Shall I go on? No. It says, the elegant designer-clad blonde sitting in front of me bristles. I think it's irrelevant whether I've seen someone in their underwear or not, she sniffs. <laughs> sniffs. <laughs> uh, the male says, come on, Jennifer, don't be a sports sport. We know you know. Well, yeah, she might know, but we don't want to think about it, thank you very much. I mean, can you imagine Boris Johnson in his underwear? It'd be like a space hopper in a bad wig. No offence. The mail says, Jennifer Akuri, the 35-year-old American businesswoman, famously gave the then London mayor tech tutorials in her flat. Disgusting. That is her flat where she practised pole dancing. And who, until today, has never directly confirmed a four-year affair four years with uh, bozo did you have an affair asks the male and then and then wrote that she said i think that goes without saying she purrs throatily <laughs> she says it's pretty much out there but i'm not going to talk about it and then she proceeds to do just that. Oh, no. In an exclusive interview, Jennifer Akuri tells how Boris Johnson, who was married to his second wife, Marina Wheeler, at the time... No! ...mother of his four children, or four of his children. We don't actually know how many in total. I don't think he does. <laughs> Approximately to uh, the nearest round the number, Boris, how many? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in an exclusive interview, Jennifer Akuri tells how Boris, who was married to his second wife, Marina Wheeler, bombarded her with, quotes, <laughs> avalanches of passion. I'll just let that sit there for a while. Avalanches of passion. Definition of avalanche, by the way, a huge mass falling rapidly and overwhelming whatever is below it. And she uh, describes him waddling about in his underwear, eating cheese, and moaning about his enormous fatness. <laughs> hey, Boris. Stop whining. <laughs> his departure from City Hall in 2016 coincided with Jennifer's decision to end the relationship in October last year. She discovered that a newspaper was about to reveal her relationship with Johnson amid conflict of interest allegations while he was London mayor. And he cast her aside, she said, like some gremlin. A gremlin? Gremlin! Warning! Warning! Don't get her wet! Jennifer R. Curry received £126,000 of your money for various business ventures and went on three overseas trade trips led by Boris after officials had initially turned her down for two of them. An, in an investigation by the Independent Office for Police Conduct found no evidence that Johnson influenced the payments to Arcuri or played a, an active part in securing her participation in trade missions. But, it said, he should have declared her as a potential conflict of interest. A separate London Assembly inquiry will look into his conduct during his time as mayor. Can we just skip to the part where no one is found to have done anything untoward and lessons must be learned? In other news, that story that that uh, last chap was talking about. Council tax must be paid on uh, the second home in Durham in which uh, Dominic Cummings and his family stayed during the lockdown. A government agency has ruled. But the Valuation Office Agency decided not to backdate what could be £50,000 in unpaid council taxes on the property since it was built on his parents' North Lodge estate in 2002 without permission. What? No permission. Did you get that? Dominic Cummings' family built two houses without planning permission 
then didn't pay council tax on them for 18 years, and apparently there's nothing to see here, please move along. <sighs> Fabulous. The issue was referred to the uh, Valuation Office Agency in June after Durham County Council found that there had been historical breaches of planning and building control regulation during the construction of the property and the conversion of another into two homes. At the time, the council said it could not take enforcement action against the family because of a time limit on such measures. You know, I would imagine that if you or I had built two houses without planning permission, they would be a pile of rubble by now because the council would have come along and told us to knock them down. And if we hadn't paid our council tax for 18 years, I'd imagine we'd be in jail. And, of course, we would have been fined for visiting them when the rules on COVID specifically prohibited it. And we'd have had our driving licence taken off us for getting behind the wheel of a car to test our eyesight. Which is an excuse so stupid that it must have just been them trolling us to see how much they can push us and get away with it. You know, for fun. What excuse can we come up with that's just so out there that, um, that it, we're, we're basically just playing with them now? Oh yeah, I know. I wanted to drive around in a car to see whether I could, you know, see or not. Oh, I bet they had a right laugh about that one. Despite guidance specifically banning the use of second homes during the lockdown, The Guardian and The Daily Mirror revealed that Cummings and his family travelled to the Durham property at the height of lockdown. He made the 260-mile trip after his wife became sick with suspected coronavirus on the 27th of March, a day before he also became ill. And other people who have uh, transgressed in this manner either get fined or fired. And then Dominic Cummings, an unelected official, one of those people that Brexiters uh, uh, were supposed to be against, and that he was leading... He is a leading Brexiter. In fact, it's probably down to him and uh, a couple of three billionaires that we're actually leaving at all. Supposed to be against um, uh, unelected officials. He is the unelected official that's running this country. He used the full power of the office of the Prime Minister and announced from the garden of Number 10 Downing Street that the property he went to was an isolated cottage on his father's farm somewhat forgetting to mention that as co-owner of the property it's also his second home something that he, he his own blooming rules said you couldn't visit and so they're not going to backdate council tax well, which has infuriated some Durham councillors speaking to the Northern Echo John Shuttleworth who does sound like he comes from the North doesn't he John Shuttleworth and it, 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 that, that's, isn't that the guy that did, uh, in the punk years, Gordon is a moron? Um, what was his name? Oh. Jilted John. <coughs> Pulled that right out of the air. Jilted John. Gordon is a moron. Remember that? All the hits. We're still not missing you, Gordon. <coughs> but we'll, we'll let you know if we do. Actually, he popped up the other day, and uh, it, did, it did remind you what an, a proper leader actually looks like. You know, somebody with uh, somebody who is thoughtful and intelligent, as opposed to the uh, kaleidoscopic clan show that we've got now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where are we? <laughs> oh, those were the good old days when you could actually uh, rely on somebody to act like a leader. Anyway. John Shuttleworth, an independent councillor out of Durham, said if it was anybody else, they would be getting charged and it would be backdated or it would be getting taken to court. It just proves there's two sets of rules, one for them and another for everybody else. It's not right, he said. And he's right. It's not right. But it is entirely predictable. In a statement, the Valuation Office Agency decided not to backdate what could be 50 grand in unpaid council taxes on a property that was built without planning permission, for crying out loud. Said, we treat all taxpayers equally. <laughs> and we value domestic properties in line with legislation, which sounds very much like, don't question us, peasant. 
Grace in Epsom texts, uh, please can you play uh, that call of the guy from Parsons Green? The one that said hello in the funny manner. You mean this guy? Oh, uh, hello. <laughs> he cracked me up. It says, uh, yeah, the one that said, oh, uh, hello, in a funny manner. Oh, uh, hello. He says, I listened to the Nick Abbott Habit podcast and laughed so much while parking my car that I scratched it. Yeah, sorry about that, Grace. It was pretty funny. I think it's the last one that I put up there. They, they, um, there's two podcasts that come out on Mondays, the Nick Abbott Habit and the one that I did with Carol McGiffin called What's Your Problem with Nick and Carol? And the Nick Abbott Habit is uh, clips that I put together of old shows before virus uh, had uh, the virus had ever been uh, heard of. It's totally virus-free. Um, one of them was, um, I think I'd been uh, less than respectful to uh, Uncle Nige. Whinging and whining and moaning. And um, he called up uh, rather upset with me. I think it was the podcast from when uh, Uncle Nige uh, put his new party together. And the uh, and they had a launch party in the disinfectant factory or something stupid like that. <laughs> anyway, I was less than impressed and I went off on one about it. And this bloke called, um, yeah, he was, uh, he was very, very upset. Oh, hello. That's how it started and it went downhill from there. I think it's the last one that I put up. So, if, if not the last one, then the one before last. So, look it up on the World Wide Way. It's one of the podcasts I do. It's called The Nick Abbott Habit. And uh, you can thank me later. No, wait. I've changed my mind. You can thank me now. Thank you. Let's have a call in Stepney. Hello, Pat. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, being serious for uh, five minutes, if you can just spare me five minutes. No, what I want, you know when Boris gets up there to take questions from the floor? Yeah. You know, when he does it, he's on the podium and he's, he's spatted out what he's going to spat out and then he says, no. uh, questions. I want, like, Robert Preston or Laura Oh, Kunzberg. no, no, not Robert no, Preston. Or any, or any person that has got the bottle to say, what is this costing, the real cost to this country? Mm. He'll go, oh, look at the website. You know... <laughs> I, that, I, was I un, really... that was uncanny. It's like you just passed the phone to him. Wow. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, when the final books are rewritten, when the final legislature... Leg, yeah, when, legislature when historians sheets, look back and uh, look no, at this when mess... when the final legislature sheets... The what sorry, now? I'm saying like Boris... Um, are written for the uh, for the accounts. Yeah, it will scare more people than the virus ever will. Because I'll tell you for now, I'll tell you that there'll there'll be a lockdown too many. And there's and already been a lockdown too many. No, I'm saying, but you know, if ever there's a one after this or one after the, the mm. next, and they'll say, well, "Sorry, uh, uh, you know, Mister uh, Office Man or Mister." Uh, factory man, we can't furlough because we've got no more money left. Yeah, we ain't got no more money left. And 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 that is a real. I'll tell you what. That uh, if they if the people if they was to show people, you know, when Witty's or Valance shows them all the graphs, if they was to if Richie Sunak come out and showed them the yeah. graphs about the economy, yeah. it it put it put half the people into either into. Uh, um, Men, a mental fit or, or, or needing, needing what they call it, cancelling. Yeah, well, I, I need cancelling just thinking about it. He, he would uh, unveil his graph and say, here, look at this. <laughs> People would be falling off their chairs, yes. We don't have any money anymore, uh, well, or, that... or really for the rest of our lives. The amount of money this country is in debt is just, I don't even want to think about it. You know, and it's, it is scary. It is really, really scary. Yeah. It scares me more than the virus. Right, but on the plus side, Boris Johnson's just hired a, a new personal photographer at uh, great expense to us, poor dopes who pay taxes. So, you know, that's good. You know them, you know them photographers, you know the early photographers where they used to have to put the, uh, the sheet over their head to take the photographs, but they yeah. have to put the sheet over Boris Johnson. Over his head to take the photograph, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Pat. 0345 6060 973. So the government isn't looking too good at the moment, so in true what would Donald Trump do mode, they've decided that it would be better to fix the image than fix the problem. 
So they're not ditching the private contracts that cost billions to produce nothing. They aren't cancelling the increased privatisation of the NHS or firing inept cabinet members or replacing a leader who's out of his depth. Instead, they're hiring a £60,000 a year photographer to make the Prime Minister look good. Actually, that's less what Donald Trump would do and more like what Kim Jong-un would do. Except that if the photographer actually uh, ac accidentally takes an unflattering image of the dear leader, they probably won't be shot out of a cannon. Talk about image over substance. But there is no substance, so let's manage the image. Number 10 is seemingly attempting to remedy our belief that their performance is abysmal by hiring a £60,000 a year photographer to make them look better. And it's not the first time for this kind of thing. The, the scourge of the unelected bureaucrat, the unelected bureaucrat uh, demonic Cummings, advertised for government communications operatives to mirror what Donald Trump's got, you know, to communicate to the country on behalf of the Prime Minister. For a hundred thousand pounds a year. What? They, they, they have to figure out what he's saying and then translate it into words that make sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where do we... Uh, it's definitely worth £100,000 a year. And they advertised to, for not one, but five deputy heads of news to manage the message at £70,000 each. And another £70,000 a year position to be the communications chief's aide. And after all that money, and all those experts carefully massaging the image, this is how they look. Utterly inept and out of their depth. Can you imagine how this administration would come across if it wasn't for this wall of genius media managers? It would be like the, <laughs> like the clowns that careen into the ring in a comedy car and all the wheels fall off every time Bozo leaves the house. Well, here we go, 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 okay. A job advert, uh, advert uh, posted by the Cabinet Office, which supports the Prime Minister, states that the job of the photographer will be to promote the work of ministers and the wider government visually. Well, they could station themselves outside of a walk-in fridge to capture the PM in all his frozen glory as he comes out after hiding from reporters. The advert says, no two days will ever be the same in this role. One day you may accompany a cabinet minister on an international visit, working closely with press officers across Whitehall to deliver a series of coordinated announcements. And the next you'll be working in the cabinet office, producing innovative visual content. <laughs> I mean, it's not like Bozo doesn't already have his own personal photographer, trailing the dear leader to make him look good. He's already got a personal photographer at your expense and now they're buying another one you're paying for all those superb shots of boris looking commanding and in charge like the one where he's um you know the photo that really demonstrates his uh, commanding presence like um i can't think of a single photo of him not looking like an oaf can you i mean you know that country bumpkin is his carefully prepared image but You'd think they'd have got at least one shot of him looking like a world leader. And all I can think of is, is shots of him running around panting like a jelly in a bandana. Like he's Axel Rose's granddad. A go... A go <laughs> Where'd you find that? That's a good one, isn't it? It is. Where'd you get that from? The internet. Right. Oh, the internet. Well, yeah, what do I know? What do I know about it? All I know is what's on the internet. He's, um... See, pr um, politicians and food, not a good mix. You do not want to get photographed while eating food, particularly um, an ice cream with a Union Jack stuck in it. A government spokesmodel said, We are recruiting an experienced photographer to capture and share the government's work through engaging visual content. This post will work across departments and play a leading role in upskilling the government's digital communications professionals. Does that make sense? No. This post will work across departments and play a leading role in upskilling the government's digital communications professionals. Nope, it still doesn't make any sense. 
They should get one of their genius and highly expensive media managers to put that into a sentence that actually does make sense. And all of this, of course, on top of the unbelievable amounts of your money that they've spent on consultants to make every move they make seem like magic. They spent £56 million pounds as of mid-August on consultancy firms to outsource its response to the coronavirus pandemic. Realising that they're not up, up to the job, so they paid other, more expensive people to come in and do it for them. Often, naturally, without giving other companies chances to compete for the lucrative uh, con uh, contracts. £56 million. Pounds. I think they're up to about £10 billion now. Not million, billion. £10 billion. Pounds. Just been spraying around like a, a garden hose connected to a bank. McKinsey was given £563,000 for six weeks' work. That's fourteen grand a day to establish what they called a vision, purpose and narrative for a permanent replacement for Public Health England, which is going to be fronted by the uh, former, employee, <laughs> former employee of that company, Baroness Dido Harding. You know Dido Harding? Boo! Yeah, that's her. Fourteen grand a day they were hired uh, on to try to sell us on an idea that was so bad that they needed to spend fourteen grand a day to persuade us that it made sense. What a way to run a country, eh? Dreadful. Uh, how is he building another golf course? He, he's broke, isn't he? Aren't you totally broke, Donny? I make four hundred million dollars a year, so what difference does it make? Yeah, sure you do, Donny. Sure you do. President Donald Trump lost three hundred and fifteen point six million dollars since the year two thousand from fifteen golf courses he owns in the US, Scotland and Ireland. The New York Times found in a bombshell report published in September. Trump bought his national Doral golf course in Miami for $150 million in 2012, and over the next six years lost $162 million on the property. <laughs> he is the worst businessman ever. He's a terrible businessman. He's just good at playing one on television. And uh, a certain demographic believes it. I love the poorly educated. Exactly. The president's three European golf courses reported a total loss of $63.6 million. Loss. So how's he building another one? The losses that Trump has experienced at his golf courses aren't an anomaly. The Times investigation found that the president has lost millions of dollars at nearly all of his major businesses. <laughs> Uh, the only way he's going to stay out of jail is to uh, steal the election. Uh, one way or the other. We know it's not going to be proper. Everything that I've done is 100% proper. That's what I do is I do things proper. He lied. 0345-6060-973. Let's have a call in. Uh, it's been waiting the longest. Let's have Kingston. Oh, Kensington, rather. Penelope. Bye. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Uh, hello. As one of the elite, um, I would like to put forward a couple of questions here, if you don't mind. Well, I do um, mind, Penelope. Okay, well, there you go, you see. No, no, wait, um, wait, wait. You have to turn your radio down, is what oh, I mind. Oh, do I? Yes, oh, you do. Got, does one have to turn one's television one off? One has to turn everything off. Okay, just one moment. Pull, we'll do that, then. One has to pull everything out of one's wall. Oh, I say. Or, do, oh, or, or get somebody to do it for you. Don't be silly. One lives on one's own. Okay. One lives on one own, one's own. Get on with it, Penelope. Right. Okay, right, okay, rather, sorry. Uh, just a thought for today, you know, me being a well-educated person. <coughs> I would just like to read something for you, being well-educated. Read? Uh, okay, yes. Okay. Read? No, wait, 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 right, wait, okay. wait. What is oh. it that you're going to... Wait, what is it you're going to read? Okay, it's um, something I've had an observation of. Okay. Oh, you're going to read something that you've written? No, I wouldn't write. I'm not educated. Well, what are you reading? Oh, achievement, oh, achievement. How great thou art. Penelope, what are you reading? Um, it's something one's written. Who's written? Well, one that's educated. Who? So, it's, uh, well, you have to guess, you see. Is it, is, it a, is it a poem? No, it's an observation. And yeah, but it's, it, sound, it sounds like a poem. Is it a poem? Yeah. Could be, possible, yeah. That sounds like a yes. Well, you know... Well, we don't do poems. First of all... No, sorry, no poems. No, all, no poems, no jokes. Okay, first of all, okay, right. 
Is moral conduct, right, one or two things? What? Is one's moral conduct one or two things? If morals, if, if one's if moral one's, conduct, if, are you if, saying if or is? Is one's is. moral conduct, is it one or two things? Conduct? I think moral, your accent's slipping. Oh, very sorry about that. Okay, and is narcissism just for the elite? Right. What are you talking I, about? I'm not sure. Observations of people. Is narcissism, is it just for the elite? Elite, yeah. Is it possible it's just for the elite? And the other question on this is, okay... On what is? The works and pensions people, the Department of the Works and Pension in our lovely government, calculates the finances and the pensions of all those unfortunate people that we have sadly lost. There will be an awful lot of money, pensions and money, from those people whose lives we have lost. Who calculates that? Where do the finances go? And what's going to happen with that? In an ideal world, okay, trust and truth are paramount. Trust and truth are paramount. If you lose trust, you won't get the truth. Right. What, and the what, other what, what was the thing about pensions? The Department of Works and Pensions... Yes. Okay, which incidentally um, has a very private office in Chester, one knows. There's a private building in Chester that has a disablement assessment. It's actually the Department of Works and Pensions benefit office for ordinary folk. But it doesn't say that because it's managed by a private company. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, so there is no Works and Pensions Department in Chester. It is just an office that says benefit assessment. So one inquired whose building it was, what does it do, and why disabled folk are sent round the back. That building is owned by Hedge Fund Company, without a doubt. I assure you of that. Well, how do you know that? Oh, well, you see, I know many things. I'm quite wise. I've been around a long time. No, but how, do you, know, how do you know that? I research things quite clearly. Uh, don't tell me you've read it on Facebook? It might be on Facebook, I hope oh so. Oh, my God. I do... No, no, I don't do Facebook. I don't do Facebook, I've got no computers. I don't are you, do... Are you telling me the Department of Health and Social Security is run by a hedge fund? Yes, in Chester. Oh, please. I mean, I, I, honestly, I believe, I believe uh, a lot of bad honestly, things about this government, but they... But please, the, honestly, check the it out. The pensions honestly. of this country are not run by a blooming hedge fund. No, no, I'm not talking about... The building is... The building... Well, the, what's, the dif what's the difference of what the... Who owns the building? Because there should be a department, an owned department, where those assessments are done. Well, maybe... There isn't. It's but it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter who owns the building, though, surely? Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. They're, paid, they're just they paying rent. Yes, to a private company. They don't need to do that. They should build their own buildings. <laughs> well... <laughs> Yeah, it costs more in the short term to build a building rather than just to rent one that already exists. Extortionate amounts? I don't think so. Well, you've got, you've got no idea how much the, they pay in rent. Well, you know, if it's a private hedge company, it won't be two shillings, will it? And the other thing is the Department of Works and Pension calculates all the finances of the poor people that we have sadly lost due yeah. to this dreadful... But, but, so what are you suggesting? That they're taking the pensions from the people that have died and they're doing what with them? Buying comics I have no and idea. Sweets? I don't know. I'm not a mathematician, but all that money that have been lost, with these people that we've lost that aren't here anymore, yeah. what happens to those pensions? Well, what they, don't, they don't get paid. Well, of course they don't, but they've left that money to who, to where and what. And who calculates all that finances in the Department of Works and Pensions. Okay, Somebody like I said, like I said uh, Penelope, I'm prepared to believe the absolute worst of this administration, but you seriously need to stop reading the internet because it's frying your brain. <laughs> um, but I wish you all the best with your accent. 0345 6060 973. James in Swindon says, I watched a documentary about Las Vegas casinos, and the first thing they said was, the casino business model is basically bulletproof. <laughs> Donald Trump proved them wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's been less successful than any other business person I can think of. I've been successful 
in every business I've been in. Yeah, he's, he's failed in every business he's been in. It's amazing how much money he's blown through. His dad gave him something of the order of four, was it $420 million as a birthday present? Just as, uh, you know, walking about money, and he blew the lot. His dad had to keep uh, bailing him out over and over and over again. And his um, staggering ineptitude as a business person is the reason why he doesn't want to release his tax returns. That, and uh, of course he's up to his eyeballs in uh, probably dodgy Russian money. Or it could be, could be from anywhere. Got absolutely no idea. Because it's a secret. I bet the only reason that, the only way that he can um, uh, uh, organize to stay out of jail is if he becomes uh, president again, or he pardons himself. He's asked about that before. N nothing he says is a joke. He doesn't do jokes. He does um, insults, which uh, may occasionally be funny, but he doesn't do jokes about himself. Everything that he says and does, he tells you what he's going to do before he does it. I'm surprised he hasn't shot somebody on Fifth Avenue. Maybe he has. <laughs> he's just he's just confessing. It's, except that people think, oh no, he, he's, he's, he hasn't done that. Yeah, he, but he probably has. And um, uh, and what strategy do the Democrats have to prevent him from stealing the presidency? There's no strategy. I have no strategy. There's zero strategy. Yeah, they have zero strategy. They're just relying on uh, uh, politicians acting in um, what you might describe as uh, a normal way. But he doesn't do norm. Norm. Is Cheers still on? I wonder if that's funny anymore. Norm. What's up? My nipples, it's freezing outside. One of my favourite lines. Miss Tex says, you say some people should not be allowed to vote. Is that because they might come up with the wrong answer? Yes. <laughs> Peter says, schools are to blame, Nick, uh, for the uh, increase in incidents. He says, I'm, uh, I'm a teacher, secondary mixed. It's carnage. Look at the charts. Cases started doubling the first week of September. University students who caught it off their brothers and sisters from school took it en masse to uni. It's so obvious. Pubs and gyms have been open since July. Cases double every week. Uh, well, yeah, it's blooming obvious that the uh, that if you, when you cram people into university and school, of course the cases are going to go up. I mean, who couldn't have predicted that? But I don't think pubs... Are, um, have been proven to be a great centre for catching this thing. And I, I haven't read anywhere, apart from one case, I think it is in Canada, like I mentioned before, some spin class, um, where um, uh, many of the people in that class got it. I haven't heard Jim, <coughs> Jim's mentioned at all. Maybe I just haven't been paying attention. John in real texts have any of your texters slagging off real ever been there real has had a lot of money spent on it and the people of real are the best that you could meet no the people of real are far outclipsed by those the good people of prostatin as you know full well john even the people of dizzeth are better than the people in real <laughs> i think you'll find that that is correct here is Gaul in Leicester. Hello, Paul. Evening, Nick. Um, oh. I was thinking about the uh, 60k a year for the uh, snapper for Boris. Yeah, the second snapper. If I'd snapper. have known about that, then I'd put in a bid for probably half. Because I think after 10 years of taking um, waterfowl photos at the local lakes, then I've got oh, a yeah. bit of experience of uh, ducking and diving. Yeah. <laughs> These are the jokes, folks. <laughs> but... Uh, Yes, it makes me wonder exactly, um, you know, what sort of uh, bod they've got, um, what sort of experience. And well, you just have to have the uh, ability to um, find his best angle, and uh, good luck with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where do we... <laughs> I don't think he's got one. Well, yeah, it's uh, all down to the subject, and uh, I suppose the mantra that I used to work by, uh, sort of light background composition and pose. So, um, anyway... That was all, really. 
Right. OK, well, it sounds like you've said it. Thanks a lot, mate. 0345 6060 973. Genzo texts, it's always been uh, one rule for the rich and one for the common people. Anyone else that came to work with virus symptoms would have got fined, but MPs have a get-out-of-jail-free card. That's right. Uh, Jimmy in Colchester says, Nick, what happens if we're not on Twitter? What does that mean? What happens if we're not on Twitter? What does that mean? What does that mean? Yes, it's wondering. But what does that mean, though, if we're not on Twitter? Maybe it was when you asked somebody to tweet in. Mm, no, I don't understand what that means. Does it, is that one of those? It, does the does a tree make a noise in if it falls in the forest and no one's there? Is it something like that? <laughs> make sense, man. And Frank texts, "Good evening, Nick. You should be able to read into that wry smile of Johnson's every time he walks out of number ten. Total total chancer." Another one that sort of that barely makes sense, but I, that, more so than the previous one. So, you, we're, you know, with, with each passing moment, we're getting better and better. Bristol, Barry. Nick, how are we? Good, thanks. Um, I think I need your help. I have an addiction. Yes. Um, I am on my seventh Donald Trump book. <laughs> what? Um, and I cannot abide him, but... I'm reading these books to try and understand why the hell anybody would ever vote for this lunatic. And um, I've not found the answer yet. Same reason that people voted for Brexit, because they were persuaded by someone who was lying his face off that he had their interests at heart. He's absolutely frightening. So, so when you say, when you play that bit that says there's no strategy, there's no strategy, mm. there is no strategy. I mean, uh, the guy does not understand strategy at all. No, he doesn't and have a strategy, but the people who are providing him with the money and who are greasing his path, they have a strategy. <laughs> Yeah, but they're poking him into the direction that they want him to go. But because he has no strategy, he's easily manoeuvred into those spaces. Uh, yeah, I'm, I bet that he's less easily manoeuvred than they thought that he would be. I, I, ex I expect that they thought, this is a guy off TV, he reads scripts on TV, he uh, takes direction, we'll be able to get him to, to do pretty much what we want. And then they unleash this, <laughs> this crazy animal... <laughs> <laughs> and um, and he just ripped up the script. So I bet yeah. it's not going entirely to plan, but they're no. probably still making an enormous amount of money out of it. Honestly, he's an absolute lunatic. And um, at, there is an insidious element to this as well. So I've just started reading the book uh, Dark Towers, which is about the relationship that he has with... Well, the book focuses on the relationship between him and Deutsche Bank, but it also oh. talks about other elements... Um, and essentially, he has stiffed everybody that he's ever borrowed money from. And I know you talk about that a lot, but you cannot underestimate how much he has shafted people for cash over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. I mean, it is modus operandi to sign a contract where he can essentially not pay them for the money that they've loaned him. Um, and and he just waltzes off. He yeah, or, or, he's, or he's pay the off. or pay the construction crew that that puts his buildings up. I mean, oh, well, that's he's, interesting he's one. been involved in thousands of lawsuits. What does that tell you about him? Well, I mean, it, 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 <laughs> on no level does that surprise me whatsoever. But you know, I mean, if you listen to uh, some of the things that he's said in the past, he has clearly used mafiosa type activity. Well, he to acts like a don, the union. and he talks like a don. He talks Nobody's about done uh, it. yeah, he talks about people who are rats, and they're um, uh, yeah, he talks like uh, a sort of a comedy. Uh, mafia guy. But, you know, it, somebody who's in construction in New York is, is uh, re regardless of how illegal, decent, honest and true they are, is going to come across uh, organised crime. But, it's, but it's whether they, it's whether, it. Well, it's whether they welcome them in with open arms or not. I, mean, I don't think there's any actual evidence that he is um, part of that crew, but, but uh, I would be surprised well. if he wasn't. So, so he has 
certainly exhibited behaviours that would suggest that yeah, he is. That's right. Um, and he has done things that absolutely would point to that. So he has got uh, several moments on record where he said, don't worry about the unions, I've taken care of it, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, swimming with the fishes and all that. The thing about him is that he tells you what he's doing the the criminality that he's involved with while he's doing it which is, <laughs> is so unheard of that people just assume that he's joking but he's not joking he's, he's telling you not. what he's doing while he's doing it yeah uh, okay um, well keep researching uh barry and um give me a full report first thing thanks a lot mate yeah the 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 one um quote that keeps coming back to me is about uh, deals and we should be very concerned about him um b stealing the election which is what we're being faced with here he's going to steal the election i bet you there's so many ways in which he can do it but um when he makes a deal according to donald trump himself the only way that it's a good deal as far as he is concerned is if he wins and everybody else loses. Because he has the mindset of somebody that uh, wants to rip you off. And so he assumes that everybody wants to rip him off too. And so only if everyone loses can he feel that he hasn't been ripped off. And he takes everything personally. And he holds a grudge forever. Richard Branson met him once, and he said, um, Branson said it was the most dispiriting meeting he'd ever had with a businessman, because all, all Trump did the entire time they were together was uh, complain about, oh, I'm going to get this person, I'm going to get that person, and this guy's going to um, get it in the neck from me, and I'm going to uh, get my own back on this guy, and it was just this list of people, it was uh, like, you know, like a child. It's, um, it, it, it is really incredible. I mean, apart from everything else that's going on, that we've got this uh, clown who has taken over the richest country in the world by first taking over the richest political party in the world. And he did it easily. Yeah, people, uh, you, know, the, you look at the History Channel and, and you see, uh, you know, these documentaries about dictators. You know, including... There is, by the way, a, um, a poll, not a poll, it's a, um, what do you call them? Um, a, 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 a campaign. One of these internet campaigns on change.org. You know that, uh, politicians are about to get, uh, <laughs> they're about to get another pay rise. What? Yeah, £3,300 a year. Well, there's a, a, you may want to sign this, or you may not. Depends on how you feel. I'm just passing this on as information. It's a campaign called Get the Pay Rise for MP, or, or Stop, rather, Stop the Pay Rise for MPs. Let's appreciate NHS workers instead. It says MPs could receive a pay rise of £3,300 per year from April next year on top of their annual salaries, whilst our communities and businesses are facing financial uncertainty. The proposed pay rise would mean that most MPs would earn over £85,000 a year. Meanwhile, the average salary of a nurse is £33,000. Is it? I would have thought it would be much less than that. Uh, but I suppose they know what they're talking about. I don't think this is fair, says the... Um, it's, not a, it's a petition, that's what it is. And says this petition, and I'm calling for the MPs' pay rise to be stopped. Throughout this pandemic, NHS workers have stood on the front line and sacrificed a lot for this country. If anything, they should be rewarded for their efforts, not MPs. The proposed pay rise for MPs is calculated on a dated system. Monies should be redistributed. Equal pay and equal rights should be for all. Well, not... yeah. Uh, let's not get carried away. You're never going to get people to uh, sign up for equal pay. I mean, even the lowest of the low uh, don't actually want that because they imagine themselves uh, in the p position of earning a lot in future. But if you're not rich already, then it is vanishingly unlikely that you will be rich. Uh, you could buy a winning lottery ticket, I suppose. This says, think of your local MP. Is the value of their work worth this pay rise? Well, let me think about that for a second. No. No. 
Now think of your NHS employees. Do they deserve to have their wages lagging behind inflation? No. If you agree that it's not appropriate for MPs to get a pay rise next year, let's challenge the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority on this proposal by saying no 3K rise for MPs. The MPs' pay proposal is now open for consultation until the 6th of November, with the final decision due in December. If we all make our voices heard now, says this petition, this can still be stopped. I, yeah, I very much doubt it. How many have they got at the moment? Let me just check. Checking for you while you wait. Hmm. Mm -hmm. 241,475 at change.org. Stop the pay rise for MPs. Well, it actually says stop the pay rise for MP. Let's appreciate NHS workers instead. 241,480 and counting. I just passed that on as information. You may or may not want to sign it. Select. Let's have a call in Hampton. Matthew. Yes, good evening. Yes, um, Matthew. Great show as usual. Um, Thanks. Uh, as I just said a moment ago... Um, to whom? Uh, you're not going to agree with... Well, the producer. Um, I... Um, you're not going to agree with me here. Oh, um, no. but, here we go. Um, <laughs> um, I have to say, I'm in stitches of laughter this evening. Um, and I'll tell you why I'm in stitches of laughter, uh, listening to the show. Um, would you believe it? I actually like Trump. And um, he doesn't have any effect on me whatsoever. He's in America, and I'm living in Hampton, Middlesex. <laughs> and <laughs> I, 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 I switch... <laughs> I switch um, Sky News on on a regular basis, yeah. and I find I'm booked because I find him uh, very entertaining. Yeah, he's got charisma. Um, yeah, and also the same with Boris. I mean, you know, they, they've got this new spitting image program that's come out. Yeah, um, can you get that on ordinary TV, or have you got to go and buy a box? No, Brit, uh, Brit uh, something or other, I'm not, I'm not too sure. So you've got to buy another that. box? Yeah, I believe so. I've got... Oh, I've got for Sky, crying out but, um, loud, how many boxes do you have to buy? Well, it's crazy. But um, also, the other thing, two two more quick points. Yeah. Because um, I know you're busy. Um, not, but, re um, not really. Well, just, it's know. just talking. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> well, the situation in terms of um, the 420 million that his dad gave him and he, yeah. he spent, because uh, he's got a bit... He is a loose cannon. Um, and then, you know, obviously he was bailed out, as you said. And But in terms of that photographer, yeah, um, who's being paid 60000 or, yeah. or whatever. Boris's second um, personal photographer, because he needs two, you know, apparently. Yeah, well, I don't see anything wrong in that, because what? that guy's probably probably got a lot of celebrity clients. How do you and, know? Well, I would imagine so, if he's, uh, someone like Boris Johnson's entertaining him. If if you if you're earning if you're going to apply for a job that pays sixty thousand pound a year, then I very much doubt that you're the kind of celebrity photographer that's got a lot of uh, well-known clients. Well, Boris has obviously been tipped off that he's very good. I mean, Boris. No, I, I, needs no, a, you you misunderstand. Yeah. This is an advert. They're advertising for a photographer, and the pay is sixty thousand. Oh right. Well, that's not enough for for the uh, prime minister, is it? Really? Well. <laughs> Boris well, earns I mean, Boris earns more than that, but I'm not sure the photographer of the Prime Minister should earn more than that. All, also, very quickly, uh, yeah. you know the situation you were talking about with the, um, the members of Parliament giving pay rises? Yeah. It's the same as... Well, it's not the same, but, but footballers, some of them run absolute oh, fortune. No, that does make no difference. Uh, footballers, no, are no. In the, footballers are in the entertainment business. Y yes, 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 I agree. But I, I would never begrudge anyone who earns hell of a lot of money because they didn't ask me to work in the insurance industry. Yes, but even if you're paying for it and they're doing a terrible job. Yeah, well, it's up to the, uh, the you know, the chairman or the, the manager to, to no, decide. No, it isn't. It's up to you. Well, I, you know, I, I don't begrudge anyone. Anyone who's successful... Well, that's I, daft. You know. If somebody is successful and working against your best interests and you are paying for it, how can you not object to that? Well, because I love going to see Chelsea play and, um, you know, and most of them are on absolute fortunes. Yes, but that, they're in show business. Yeah, of course they're like pop stars. Of course. So what's that got to do with the Prime Minister? Well, the Prime Minister is, you know, obviously one of the most important people in the UK. 
Yeah. So surely he deserves a huge salary. It's a lot of responsibility with the position, isn't there? Yeah, I'm I'm aware of that. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I I don't really understand what point you're making. Well, I, I, I don't understand why anyone would begrudge him that we you know his lifestyle or, or lack of lifestyle half the time. Um, but but you know the privileges he, he gets and the salary he earns when he's you know he's, he's he's got a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. Obviously, as you can tell, I'm a, no. I'm he's a, he's a, outsourced his responsibility to consultants at the at the cost of fourteen grand a day. No, I mean, still, plus this petition was not about him. It's about MPs in general, he's, whose, he's, whose pay I think should be being reduced because of the catastrophic effect that they've had on this country. He's still the the, the leading man in, in in politics, isn't he? Well, it's the second the leading man, apparently, because Dominic Cummings is the one pulling the strings. The unelected well, bureaucrat, alleged, 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 who is supposedly yeah. the uh, scour scourge of the unelected bureaucrats. Right. Irony. Right. Look well, it up. Yeah. Well, Title-wise, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Title-wise, title -wise. right now, it's uh, Boris. Yeah. He's got the title. And, um, yeah, he, he's the guy at the front of the stage flapping his arms around while the uh, real business is being taken care of in the shadows behind him. Yeah, all right, thanks a lot, Matthew. So he's, uh, he's all for Donald Trump because, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's funny. And he's a nice person. Donald Trump is not a nice person. <laughs> Sean texts... It's all very easy for Sage and other medics to insist on full lockdowns as they will not be affected. Their highly paid jobs are protected, and so they have no financial worries, unlike the millions who are facing disaster. So Sage and other medical advisors should have their pay totally suspended until this is over. Then I believe they would not be recommending full, open-ended lockdowns. Yet yeah, a problem with um, government policy based on scientists is that scientists are... Um, they have the blinkers on. They're only thinking about their speciality. And if they are epidemiologists, they will only think about what would be the way in which we could save the most lives. And the way that we can save the most lives is to lock everybody inside and not let them out again, ever, until we get a vaccine. And that's what they will probably want. So we should not be listening to them. I mean, not entirely uh, disregarding what they say, but what they say is not based on what the uh, the overall maximum benefit for the country would be, which is surely not to lock us down and for millions of people to lose their jobs and for millions of businesses to um, wind up and close their doors and never reopen them again. If anybody can remember the 1970s, we don't want to go back there because it would be worse this time around. We'd be more in debt... And the music would be worse. I mean, we ain't never going to have no Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here and physical graffiti and um, the smoke you drink, the play you get, and all of that good stuff. That's over. We're never going to have those again. It's going to be some drippy rock band who sounds a, a bit like a wet velvet underground at best. So, no, we do not want to go back to the 1970s. I mean, just the hairstyles should make you want to avoid that. But the misery of the 70s, it really does bring it home to you when you see something from the 70s on TV, like the Sweeney or something like that. I mean, those old shows that they went around London, it was, it was like a bomb site. It looked like a third world country compared to what we got now. I mean, as surprising as that may sound to those who didn't live through the 70s, it did. It, it was like a third world country compared to what we've got now. God, I went through, um, well, I, I grew up in Edinburgh, which was uh, relatively refined. But you go to Glasgow in the 1970s, holy smoke. There was some. Um, it was a, a bomb. It, it was like a bomb site. So many places were like that because of the grinding poverty, which is where we're going. Britbox is a, a subscription service like Netflix. Is that right? Yes. 
How many boxes can they be selling us? I mean, what's on it? It's not from... an actual box. You just oh? sign up to it online. Well, you don't get a box? No. Why is it called Fred Box? Because <laughs> it's on the box. You'd, oh, 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 right. The box. Right. Yeah. I get it. Well, what else is on it? Um, lots of old BBC sitcoms. What? Programmes that we paid for already? And things like A Touch of Frost. Right. OK. Well, then, uh, let, let me think about that for a couple of seconds. No, 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 no. So, did you hear about our boats? Britain's newest aircraft carrier flooded to the depth of three feet after a water leak in the engine room. It's the second time that HMS Prince of Wales, uh, a £3.1 billion state-of-the-art ship, has flooded in the past five months. <laughs> this ship's going down. <coughs> Navy sources confirmed that the water was at least three feet deep at one point and flooded an engine compartment. It's the second time that the warship has developed a leak. In May, a video emerged of water pouring through the ceiling into an accommodation area. In January, more than 100 sailors had to abandon the ship and spend the night on their sister ship, HMS Queen Elizabeth, after HMS Prince of Wales suffered a power cut in Portsmouth Harbour. And in July last year, HMS Queen Elizabeth had to cut short sea trials after a seal burst, causing a large quantity of water to pour from a pipe and flood through several decks. Then in 2017, HMS Queen Elizabeth also faced multi-million pound repairs after, after it was discovered that a faulty seal on a propeller shaft was letting in 200 uh, litres of uh, seawater an hour. The identical aircraft carriers built in Scotland for 62 billion pounds are the Navy's largest and most powerful ships ever. They're due to serve the country for the next 50 years. And all that is to be expected, because they're just sea trials and shouldn't detract from the magnificent sight they'll, they'll be on the ocean wave and how Johnny Farner will rue the day that they hove into view and loose the cannons of migrants in dinghies. That'll teach them. Except a couple or three problems. I mean, as you would expect uh, with something that has been ordered and paid for by the government, they arrived over budget late and don't work. Not because they leak, but because the ships that are supposed to escort and supply them aren't there. And we spent so much on the aircraft carriers that we can't afford the aircraft. It's like spending all your money on a wallet and having nothing to put in it. <laughs> This is from uh, Forbes from June this year. The United Kingdom is spending nearly $8 billion building two new, large, conventionally fueled aircraft carriers and equipping them, the, equipping them with F-35B Lightning Stealth Jump Jets. Doesn't that sound fantastic? Yes. HMS Queen Elizabeth is scheduled to deploy for the first time next year, ending a seven-year carrier gap that began in 2014 when the Royal Navy decommissioned the last of its three Cold War vintage light carriers. Well, if we've managed for the last seven years with that one, why do we need, why do we need two now? Uh, the UK military, by then, had already sold off the carriers' Harrier jump jets. You know, the ones that uh, go straight up and down. The racket they make. Queen Elizabeth and her sister ship, the Prince of Wales, are, in theory, are the steely core of a revitalised and reorganised Royal Navy. But there's a problem. Because having blown billions of dollars building the ships, the UK government no longer can afford the aircraft, or the escorts, or the support ships that help the flat tops, you know, the aircraft carriers, to deploy, and to protect them, and give them striking power. Because you can't just sail a, uh, an aircraft carrier out. It's got to have uh, a bunch of boats um, in its wake to protect it. Because it's basically just a, it's, it's a floating um, aircraft. Uh, uh, I mean, um, airport. It can't protect itself uh, very well until the, um, not that I have any idea what I'm talking about, but until the, the planes are in the sky, it's, um, it's just like a floating target. So we spent all our money on, uh, on these two new uh, flat tops, is what they call them, 
but we then don't have any money to put the aircraft on the aircraft carriers or to provide them with escort ships or support ships. And nor can the government afford to modify the Queen Elizabeth or the Prince of Wales to support amphibious landings, which was one of the early justifications for cutting existing ships, such as the assault ship HMS Ocean, in order to free up money for the carriers. So we cut an amphibious uh, landing craft to free up money for these carriers and then we thought well maybe we should uh, actually have an amphibious landing craft so we'll just spend some money on uh, modifying one of those two boats the Queen Elizabeth or the Prince of Wales so that it can be uh, an amphibious landing craft but we haven't got any money because we spent all the money on <laughs> on the two boats the uh, two aircraft carriers and we can't afford the aircraft the new British carrier force is hollow, says this article in Forbes, and at least one analyst believes that the uh, Brits would be better off without it. The shortfalls are myriad, according to the National Audit Office. The carrier's air wings, at a minimum, should include a dozen F-35 jets, plus a dozen Merlin helicopters, some of which would carry the Lockheed-made uh, um, early warning radar in order to provide sensor coverage. But guess what? The radar system doesn't work. It's 18 months late, which is going to affect the carrier's strike capabilities in its first two years. This is according to the National Audit Office. They said the Ministry of Defence did not oversee its contract with Lockheed Martin effectively, and despite earlier problems on the project, neither was it aware of the subcontractor's lack of progress until it was too late to meet the target delivery date. The government spent millions of pounds, billions, billions of pounds of your money on something that doesn't work. <laughs> Can you believe that? Affirmative. Further delays mean that it doesn't expect to have a full airborne radar capability until May 2023. So, if you're an invading force, could you just pencil in summer two years from now for an attack? We'd appreciate it. Thank you. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Defence has also been slow to buy F-35 jets. You know, the planes that are the whole point of the aircraft carrier. From 2015, its intention had been to buy 138 of these jets. And the Ministry of Defence initially ordered 48, but hasn't yet committed to buying any more. Because we ain't got no money. So it's going to receive seven of these 48 jets in 2025, which is a whole year later than planned. So actually strike that request. If Vlad the Insaner or whoever else we imagine is going to invade the Silly Isles, could you just wait five years and then we'll be up and running? So a single Queen Elizabeth class flat top can carry as many as 24 F-35s. But we've got 48 of them for both boats, which probably won't allow for uh, a 24-plane air wing, because uh, you've got to take into account they don't all work at the same time. Some are being main maintained and they're emptying the ashtrays and giving them a wash down. They don't all work at the same time. So you need more than you actually need to have a full force, and we haven't got that. And we've laid up our um, all but one of our support ships. Now, those are the things that actually provide the, the, uh, the maintenance for the boats and, crucially, food. We've got two aircraft carrier and only one support ship. They sail along with the frontline vessels to keep them stocked up with food and parts and weapons. You know, bullets. Very important. And the National Audit Office warned that the Defence Ministry has long been aware of this uh, being a, a restriction on the operational freedom of the carrier strike force, um, but they haven't developed a solution yet. Presumably, they want to um, uh, <laughs> they want to contract out that decision to uh, oh I don't know let's get Serco to do it. So we've got two world class aircraft carriers that leak and don't have enough, you know, aircraft. And even if they did, they wouldn't be able to sail anywhere because the crew would die of starvation. Truly, they are the envy of the world. In November last year, the Ministry stopped the competition to build three new support ships because of concerns about value for money. 
It believes the delay. Uh, the, it believes it believes this will delay the introduction of new ships by between eighteen and thirty-six months, making it uncertain that the first new ship will be operational before the existing support ship leaves services in twenty twenty-eight. So, cancel what I said before, Vlad. You know the date we agreed for your invasion of the Isle of Wight. Can we just put that back eight years or so? Give us a chance to get ready. You can text us. Uh, you'd probably be better off sending it in Morse code. I, I would be surprised if the MOD doesn't actually have mobile phones. They're still communicating by semaphore. Send us a fax, Vlad. And you'd think that that was bad, but it's worse than that. And I'll come to that in a minute. God. Yeah, this was barely reported, you know, just um, briefly, every now and again. Because the people's eyes glaze over. You, you start throwing uh, numbers at them and their eyes glaze over and they just think, oh, what else is on? It's all your money. You know the money that you pay in tax? You might as well just set fire to it. So, are you with me so far? No. Okay, in short... A British carrier group, I'm talking about the Royal Navy. <laughs> a, Br a British carrier group, at a minimum, should include one frigate for anti-submarine protection, plus a destroyer for air defence. So that's one, what they call a flat top, which is the one that's got the aircraft on, but unfortunately we can't afford the aircraft. We can, we can afford the aircraft carrier, but not the aircraft. So we've got one of them, and they, they, at least two boats, well three actually, accompany it. You got one to protect it from the sky, and then one to protect it from underneath the water, and another one to bring along the food. So yummy, and you know the bullets and uh, all of that good stuff. Um, unfortunately, we spent all the money on the the aircraft carriers, and we ain't got no money for the bullets and the food and the ships that bring them along, or the ones that protect it from the sky or protect it from uh, underneath. We got some aging old boats that are due to be scrapped in 2023 and their replacements will be ready four years after that. So not only did the aircraft carriers leak and they don't have enough aircraft and they won't have the support ships to provide the crew with food and everything they need to survive, but they'll be shot out of the water by enemy submarines the moment they leave the dock. From the mid 2020s on, the carriers could be vulnerable to submarines. And it's not like we've got any money to fix this. I mean, apart from the economy being in the worst state since the invention of money, they were already cutting back before COVID struck. They were going to spend $75 million modifying one of the new boats with extra accommodations in order for it to double as an amphibious assault ship, you know, to give it uh, some extra capability. But according to the National Audit Office, the ministry in March this year dropped that amphibious requirement. So they're just defenceless floating islands for, for an enemy to use as target practice. I mean, is, is any of this surprising? No. We had an amphibious assault ship called Ocean, but experts at the Ministry of Defence scrapped it in order to free up money for the carriers. We've got two vastly expensive baubles that look great on paper, but don't actually work on water. And but considering that we don't rule the waves anymore, that any threat's going to come from a nut job driving a van down the pavement on Oxford Street or blowing up a bar in Liverpool and not invading with warships, one of the tiny bits of rock in the middle of nowhere that, we, that still flies the Union Jack, what are we spending money on this stuff for anyway? It's just the biggest vanity project on earth still trying to persuade ourselves that we rule the waves we've spent billions on things that are basically designed to fight uh, world war ii the conservatives have pretty much spent the entire budget on private companies building something that doesn't work and wouldn't be suited to the task even if it did does that remind you of anything i mean at this point our entire fleet could be overrun by captain pugwash but don't take my word for it one defense commentator wrote given that what the royal navy has become 
in return for its two carriers, and given how, at present, this investment has delivered a part-time carrier force with a small number of available fast jets, significant spares shortages, reduced escort fleet numbers, and a lack of longer-term support ships or escort elements, then perhaps the answer to the question, is it worth it, is no. It wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth the pain for the gain, at, lo at least not in the short term, they said. And as the short term appears to include at least the next eight years, we'd better hope that a certain someone doesn't manage to uh, steal the election. Because the only thing that he hasn't tried yet to boost his popularity is World War Three. I'll bring us into war. I mean, honestly, if you pay your tax, do you feel like you're getting value for money? And uh, what's the consequence of the people that are making these decisions? Well, there isn't one. They just carry on. They just brush it off. Nothing to see here. Lessons must be learned. That's about as much as they get. God. I mean, the stuff that's going on. What a way to run a country, eh? Dreadful. 0345 6060 973. Meanwhile, in Selsey, Maxine. Hello, my love. Maxine. The pigeons, my darling. You know, I found you about two months ago about the pigeons. <laughs> yes. Me baby ones. And? Well, they hatched. They look scruffy little things, lovely. No, not lovely. I've seen a picture of a baby pigeon. It's, it's I a know, I know, horrible you thing. It and, no, they're not horrible. Well, they've flown away now. Where'd they go? Well, I don't know. They all look oh the same, my God. They? I ain't spotted Take, them down the road wait, yet. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> That's the worst looking thing I've ever seen in my life. What is that? No, they're lovely. Hang, you, hang on, hang on. Maxine, on. wait a minute. Where'd you get that? Uh, the internet again. Is that a baby pigeon? Baby pigeon, beautiful. That's the worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> if you want to be alarmed... Because I've never seen a baby pigeon before. Nobody has. I mean, it's one of those um, it's one of those questions that keeps uh, coming up over and over again. What's a baby pigeon look like? Never seen one. Oh, that is absolutely hideous. Oh, my God. <laughs> I thought that was the worst thing I've ever seen until he just popped up another picture of it. Oh, no. Oh. How could you what's stand it? How could them? you stand it, Maxine? That's yeah, but hideous. What's actually wrong with them? I don't know what's wrong with them. It actually looks like Boris Johnson with a beak. Well, that's what I mean. It's got the same sort of haircut, hasn't it? Yes, oh, it does. Place. It does. Looks like a baby Boris. It does. It looks. Well, we can't actually say that because he has got a baby now, and I don't think it looks like a squab because that's what they call baby pigeons. We can't call Boris that. Because we'd be in trouble. <laughs> now. It does have Boris Johnson's hair. That's really... I know. Or oh, Donald Trump's, or one of the two. Well, there you go. Same I could colour. one Trump and one Boris, couldn't I? I had two of them. <laughs> but you know what happened? What? You know, a couple of weeks ago, when we had the really strong winds. Yeah. Well, I spoke to him during the night. I go out of a night, and I used to, like, do like your birdie talks, whistle and all that sort of stuff, and ask if they were okay. Like well, you, 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 you walk and talk and squawk with the animals. Well, I, well, I'm like like Mrs. Doolittle, <laughs> but an older version, my love. Anyway, I was out there, and then the next time I went out there, the nest is empty. Off they've gone. Right. Well, probably, yeah. um, pr probably been eaten or. No, they didn't. No, they haven't. Don't, they haven't been eaten. How do you know that? Well, I don't actually know that, but I'd I wouldn't like to think they've been eaten. Cats now, would um, see. see cats don't. Cat. cat do, well, there you go. Cats don't mind. Oh, Doris, uh, yes. if it's uh, hideous. They'll just eat it anyway. See, I've got well, a more accurately, they'll they'll kill it and and then not eat it. No, no. So I've just seen feathers in the garden. Right. No feathers. Now, I've got to ask you a serious question. Yes. With the COVID and all the lockdowns and that, I'm getting very confused with the bubbles. <laughs> right, now, 
these bubbles are confusing me. Mm. I don't even know what bubble I'm in. <laughs> what bubble are you in? Um, I'm in my own personal bubble, Maxine. What, on your own? Yes. Oh, so you can invite five of us round and we could all become a bubble. Yeah, we, th well, that's right. We could bring our own personal bubbles and then coalesce into one giant bubble. One giant bubble? Yeah. yeah Boris won't like that. Well, we'll just not tell him. Well, what do you think? What is your opinion? Do you think we'll have a lockdown? Aren't we having one? It's tier two already. Well, I don't know, because I'm in, I'm in Sussex, and we're all right. We ain't got it over here. We don't want no one over here with the COVID. <laughs> yeah, we walk around with our face, face masks on. Maxine, uh, I, I, have, I, have, I'm, I have no idea what you actually look like, but my bet is that you would look fantastic in a really large face mask. Do you mind if I say well, that? No, that's all right, my darling, because otherwise I'd go out and scare people, but there you go. So, anyway, I've got one of them visors. I can't wear them masks because they steam my glasses up. Yeah, a visor. They've got visors. You know, yourself on <laughs> fire, my love. <laughs> <laughs> and when you try and drink a cup of coffee... Yeah, all down your front. It don't go, it yeah. don't go down too well. No. So, anyway, you're not going on holiday this year, then. Holiday? No? Where can you go on holiday? Well, I, I've no idea. Your back garden? My back garden? Well, it's blooming freezing outside now for the next eight months. And dark, by the way. Is it next week or the week after? I don't know. It's don't just too awful to, to, con to contemplate. Oh, I've got, no, I've got major problems there. Why? Well, what, what's going on in your back garden? Well, no, not my back garden, the dark. Oh, the dark. Driving, right. driving in the dark. Mm. I can't stand it, my love. Well, I, I'm getting highly irri How How is it legal that 4 by 4s uh, lights are so high? Because you can't see when they're coming at you on no, the other side of the road. They're blinding. Yeah. And why is it that somebody in front of you, coming towards you, has to alert you that they're coming with their full beam on, not from 100 yards away, but about two metres in front of you, and there they are, shining bright, like the northern star it was coming <laughs> towards me last night. Well, it's like two suns stapled to uh, either side of the car. Yeah, four by fours. I don't know how this is legal, because it's definitely dangerous. Their yeah. headlights are too high. They shine straight in your eyes. They're supposed to point down to the ground, for crying out loud. There should be a law about that. And, by the way, morons mm. who put their fog lights on because they think it looks cool. I'm not one of them. I don't even know where my fog lights are. Right, they're front and back. <laughs> oh, right, well, I should, have a, I should test them out yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, do that. Tell me how it and goes. If, if anyone gives me grief, I should say, well, Nick told me exactly. I've got to test them out. Yeah. Well, you have a lovely evening. It's a pleasure to always talking to you, my darling. And you, Maxine. All the best. I'll find you in a few weeks. I'll look forward to it. Cheers, my dear. 0345. 6060973. I, I really wish I'd never seen a picture of a baby pigeon. Because pigeons aren't actually that bad looking. I mean, not the urban ones that have only got one leg and they, <laughs> they sort of hop about. Oh, I've had a terrible accident. There's so many pigeons with one leg. What's that about? Not those. I mean, uh, you know, pigeons that you see in the countryside, not that bad looking. They're babies? <coughs> oh, you've never seen anything more hideous. Believe me. E even um, a pigeon uh, mother uh, wouldn't love a face like that. O three four five, uh, like it, it kind of looks like um, Marty Feldman <laughs> in Boris Johnson's wig. Let's have a call in um, Richmond, North Yorkshire. Hello, Seamus. Hi, Nick. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say how much Maxine's phone call cheered me up. <laughs> yeah. But um, on a on a on the note I was going to phone about was the. Uh, aircraft carrier, and not just the aircraft carriers, it's the nuclear submarines. Uh, who are we actually at war with? Yeah, I know. 
th th these and are all weapons for another era. People don't fight wars like this anymore. Why are we spending tens of billions of pounds, well, hundreds of billions, on, on weapons that aren't suited for modern warfare? Who's, who's invading us? Exactly, and who are we going to invade? Yeah. And if somebody, you know, the, the, the only countries you could possibly say would be America, China, Russia, that would have the, the you know, the, the, the capability, uh, and we're not going to beat them anyhow. So <laughs> that's right. What, what, what's what, the what, point? What, yes. What's the point? Yeah. All of our when, weaponry, all of our vastly expensive weaponry, just seem like massive vanity projects to try to uh, to deal with our diminished place in the world. We just can't get over the fact that we don't rule the waves anymore. Exactly, and I, I think the nuclear. The reason we keep that is because it keeps us at the UN Security Council table. It gets us the ability to strut about on the world stage, giving it the big I am, for a hundred yeah. billion pounds. And given the current situation that we're in at the moment, how much of that money could be spent better? All of it. All exactly. of it. And how much of it you know, that they're saying, oh, and they're right. You know, somebody in the future, our children, are going to have to pay for what's happening to us yeah, at the moment. For the rest of their but, lives and the rest of their children's lives. And it would be so much less and so much easier if we weren't pretending that we're big boys. Exactly. Precisely I mean, right. Pretending that we're big boys. That's it in a nutshell. And we we don't need to. We, the, the, there is enough in this country that we, you know, that people can be proud of without having to go, oh, look, I've got a big stick, I can hit you with it. Yeah. You know, Belgium we, does not have nuclear weapons. What do no. we What do we need them for? Why Why are we more in danger than Belgium or Luxembourg or Switzerland or or any other country on Earth apart from the the few uh, desperate souls who are spending hundreds of billions of pounds of money they haven't got on weapons they'll never use? Well, let's pray that they that they're never used, but. but it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Well, it's just, it's just we're, staggering. We're, we're, we're a small island country. We're a tax in, avoidance in, racket off the coast of Europe. Why do we need nuclear weapons? Who's going to invade <laughs> us? What would be the point? Exactly. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't be invading here at the moment, but... Plus, the, you, you, if if you were uh, Vladimir Putin, you'd want to go and invade somewhere with better weather, wouldn't you? Like somewhere in the south of France would be nice at this time of year. It's a delight. All right, thanks a lot, Seamus. I've got to go. The, it, it's just so utterly ridiculous. And it is exactly that, that we just can't get over the f fact that we have, uh, that we just can't get used to our diminished uh, place in the world. The map's not pink anymore, and um, it just drives us up the wall. So we, in order to uh, to maintain face, we spend hundreds of billions of pounds of money that we haven't got on on weapons that are utterly useless and will and will never use. But we can stick a flag on them, and uh, everyone can have um, a, a party when they uh, slip anchor, push out to sea, <laughs> and then have to come straight back because they're leaking. God. Simtex, uh, Nick, you've got to watch the Trump show on the BBC. It's horrifyingly entertaining. If only it wasn't real. I know it's homework, but it's worth it. It looks like getting away with things by some leaders is the new theme in the world. Or actually, they may all be in competition on who can get away with the most. If only we could have Jacinda. Yes! God, wouldn't that be marvellous? I think that we've got enough money. We could couple together enough money. If we if we cancel Trident and HS2, then we could offer a package to Jacinda Arden to drag her over here. You know, like a football team. Persuading a star manager from uh, another team to come and manage this one. <laughs> 
Let's lock the door to number 10 and, ju and get Jacinda Arden over here. We'll double your, we'll double your money, Jacinda. Patrick Tex, I've just heard on the news that Trump's building a second golf course in Scotland. Personally, I wish him luck. It'll keep him occupied once his uh, upcoming retirement begins at the end of the year. Perchance to dream, eh? Go Biden. Yeah, he, he should be retiring in jail. I think the only way that he can avoid, avoid jail is if he uh, manages to steal the election in some way. We should build a wall around him. I'm building a wall, okay? I'm building a wall. I'm building a wall. Okay, I'm building a wall. And the thing about a wall is you just can't get through it. If there's a concrete wall in front of you, go through it, go over it, go around it, but get to the other side of that wall. Let's have um, Bridlington. Brian. Hi, Nick. How are you? Good, uh, thanks. I'm just up. I used to be in the Navy back in the 70s, and you're right, it's just a lot of it. It's such a waste of money and mm. a big vanity project. It, precisely, a vanity project, yeah. Well, it is because we're having to pay to be at the top table. That's what most of it's got to do with. And we've got weapons like the Trent, which we can't even use without permission from the Americans, <laughs> however. And it, 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 at this rate, it'll be the Americans who are invading. I'll bring us into war. <laughs> Probably, but at least they've got good music, or they also have good music. Well, mo much of the uh, good music out of America was stuff that they gave us, and then we sold them back better. They, yeah. don't, they don't have the Rolling Stones. We gave them the Rolling Stones. Rock and roll! And Led Zeppelin, <laughs> and all of that good stuff. Yeah, you took all that good stuff, yes. Yeah, so it's a shame. It's a lot of money. We could be spending it on a lot of good things in this yeah. country because I think we're just facing a black hole, a financial black hole, and it's really concerns me. What, what's amazing is that they just keep throwing money away, like like it's, like it's been yeah. like they can just invent more. Well, I guess that's exactly what they're doing. They're just inventing it, but someone's got to pay for it eventually. Where is it all coming from? It was only a couple of years ago where George Osborne was saying, we don't have any money, we mm. can't borrow money, there's no money tree. And now they've got getting billions and billions. Every time you turn on the TV, I think on the arts tonight or whoever, they're giving billions to Yeah, you, you know the, the last uh, Prime Minister that before the, um, the, the financial catastrophe that he helped us negotiate our way through, the last hmm. Prime Minister that actually ran a budget surplus, as in uh, didn't have to borrow money in order to get his, um, uh, his uh, schedule of works done, was Gordon Brown. Uh, well, yeah. that's incredible. It, it is. is yeah. All right, Brian, I've got to go. Um, sorry about that. I took you right at the end of the show. Not enough time. Never mind. Uh, better luck next time.